You're listening to the Joelle Martin Mastery Podcast, home of the two-hour deep dive interview with gold, platinum, and multi-platinum bands, including Stained, Blue Rodeo, The Arkells, Finger Eleven, Big Wreck, Moist, Bedouin Sound Clash, I Mother Earth, Ill Scarlet, Neverending White Lights, Thornley, and many more. Please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast as well as share, comment, and like. Now let's dive in to today's episode. Welcome everyone to today's episode of the podcast. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. We are joined by a very special guest. He's achieved a level of mastery as the drummer for multiple iconic bands. One of them is uh, one of my favorite bands of all time, Breaking Benjamin, as well as Black Label Society and Black Star Riders. So welcome to the podcast, Chad Saliga. Chad, how are you and what were you up to over this past weekend? Anything memorable transpire or just taking it easy? I actually had gigs. Um, I'm playing in a top 40 band called Turning the Tide. So I did a couple shows this weekend or last weekend and then basically laid around all yesterday. I'm getting old. So I'm like, I got to lay down. I can't stay up till like 430, 530 because we were playing in Atlantic City and we're all from PA. So it's like three hours and Maryland and stuff like that. So you get home, you're done at two, you get home at like five 30. You're just like, you feel like you drank a whole night of alcohol and it's, it puts (laughs) some miles on your body. So I, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. Do you, do you find that that's pretty necessary is to allow a little bit of downtime after you have a run of shows, just to make sure your mental health is good, that you physically feel good to check in with family, I suppose. Yeah. I, I think like in your early twenties and even thirties, you have more energy. It's newer to you when you've been doing it as long as I have for like 25 years. Um, it's good to wind down and separate this and the family life into different entities. Um, I love drumming. I love playing with musicians. I love it all. But then there's some times where it's like, you know what? I've been doing it for so long. It's time to wind down, play some candy crush, or you know, hang with the wife or call my son or stuff like that. My parents. With with 25 years of playing drums and so many gigs, you know, every year on the road, mm-hmm. were, were there any any injuries? I'm picturing a drummer like fingers, wrists, forearms. I don't know, yeah. maybe maybe ankles with all the double kick or whatever. Have you have you had any injuries and how do you overcome them or how do you prevent injuries? I dislocated my shoulder on a on, on a drum solo one time playing with Break and Ben. And I didn't know it. I had adrenaline going. And then I walked off stage and my arm just went out. So I never believed in chiropractors at this point. Well, I had no, I had a last resort. I was like, I have to get it put back in because we had a show the next day. And I met the chiropractor and he's like, it's going to feel like you slammed your arm in a car door. And he's like, one, two. And I was like, wow. And then he cr- adjusted my neck. And I was like, I think I'm in love, <laughs> you know? And ever since that, I've been seeing chiropractors. I, I, I religiously, you know, believe in what they do for the body. Um, other than that, it's just waking up like this holding sticks your whole life and uh i call it the claw every morning take a shower and then it kind of stretches it out um other than that i haven't had serious you know i've been blessed by the lord that i i haven't been that bad i think i've got more like arthritis carpal tunnel what have you on my phone or on youtube more on the uh, internet than I ever did drumming. But you got to look at it. Anything we do repetitive is going to wear and tear on your body, no matter how well your technique is or this or that. It's just the nature of the beast. Uh, Some drummers like Morgan Rose, when I toured with that dude and I complain about my neck and I'm just like this. And he's like, I'm like, how? (laughs) Like my best friend Zoltan Chaney, 
uh, amazing, amazing drummer, but his showmanship is like uncanny, like nobody you'll ever see. He'll kick cymbals, jump off, you know, wedges or uh, subs and stuff behind him and pick up his drum seat and hit cymbals. He played uh, for Vince Neil. And I'm like, how are you not hurting? Some people are just blessed to not stretch and everything and just go out there and do it. Me, I, it's, a, it's a routine. I have to like stretch, warm up. It could be more placebo. But um, other than that, I've been pretty blessed to still function as a drummer. I think when you have adrenaline going, especially when you're on tour, when you're on downtime, your body goes, well, we're chilling. Right. But if you know you got to play tomorrow, you can't call it off. Unfortunately, bands don't call off many times. Um, so you just got to pull through and just kind of knock it out, especially when you're sick. Like probably you'll ask this question, but um, when I had the opportunity to play with Stan, I got COVID. And I didn't even know well, I didn't know something was weird because I, I was coughing and I felt like I was getting a fever on stage, but I'm like, how am I freezing? It's 106 degrees on stage. It's like those kind of things. It's better to be on stage because you're not thinking about those kind of things, feeling sorry for yourself. So back to your question, I think I've done some wear and tear on my joints, um, but nothing severe to put me out yet. And that show where you dislocated your shoulder, you're telling me with the adrenaline, you were able to finish that show and then go on to play like the next night? Somehow, some way. I mean, you've heard football players break their arm and they don't even realize that their arm is completely snapped until the game is over. And then they're getting it taped and all that. Yeah, I'm a I'm a big UFC fan. And I remember a fight like so long ago where the fighter clearly broke one arm and he was kind of retreating. And you're like, OK, this is the end of the fight. And as he's retreating, the guy comes in for the kill. And with the non broken arm, he knocks out the guy. So the guy won with a broken arm using his other arm for the knockout. So it kind of reminds me of that a bit. Yeah, it's like that mind over matter concept. You know, it's like if you get stung by a bee. It still hurts, but if you look at it, it's more shock. Then it sends it to the brain. You're like, ah, you know, like that kind of thing. I've, I've damaged my knuckle uh, on snares, like spinning sticks, and I've bled a couple times there. Um, what else? Oh, I mean, what's a little blood? That's rock and roll, right? It is. I'm not the type of guy that posts it on Instagram and goes, look at my cuts. I'm not that kind of guy. I just keep it to myself. But um, there is one main thing. I'm not going to tell you the company, but I was endorsing this company and they made a bad batch of symbols when I was playing for Black Label. And I went to choke the symbol and it was like basically all the sides of this crash symbol were like you could cut cheese on it and I didn't know and I grabbed it to choke it and it took my entire nail right here and it just ripped right off in blood it was like a horror movie and I still have this line here just to remind me that's the only crazy stuff your, your, your typical neck injuries you know you're like you got to get adjusted you threw it out or this or that but nothing probably compared to a lot of other people yeah that uh, that symbol that symbol sounds like uh, mortal Kombat. raiden with the hat that's like oh, well, it was absolutely it, that like that you could toss that and dismember absolutely a few people. absolutely well, it was if, totally if ever you have to defend yourself you know uh what your weapon's gonna be true so i wanted to to start off this interview powerfully so i reached out to a mutual friend uh 
and you know this guy very well. So this is, I have some kind words from John Wysocki. So this is the former drummer for Stain. So he's been on every Stained album in their discography. They did just yeah. announce a new album finally. Uh, and now he's playing with Lydia's Castle. So lots of great music yeah. coming out with him. Uh, this is what John has to say. He says, I always was a big fan of Chad. He's a very creative player who isn't afraid to step outside the box. His style is great for any band that wants little tasty fills or hits well-placed in a song. We had some fun on the road back in the day. We became fast friends and we both just loved what we were doing, which was playing. I would love to see him again soon and catch up. Great guy, great player, and great bandmate. I always wish Chad the very best. So that's from John Wysocki of Stained. Well, thank you, John. Yeah, man, that dude is... Um... You don't realize how good a drummer is until you have to play their parts. You know, uh, I think I can say this for all musicians. When you're at this caliber and not this caliber anymore, we have a tendency of being really critical on other people. We always have an opinion, right? And over the years, I'd be like, oh, this guy's good. He's all right, whatever. You know, people bash Lars Ulrich. Here's my whole thing about Lars. One, you don't have his money. Two, you didn't write those songs or play on them. And three, you could never emulate the way he played. So the new way that I look at musicians is if you can't play exactly like them, you have no right to talk bad about them. Um, because they're all, we're all trying to do what we love to do. I always say this, we're always blessed equally, just different. Everyone has something to say on their instrument, right? Who am I to say this guy's worse than this guy? There's no such thing. That's an opinion. You can't prove it. So when I hear, you know, and I did my fair share of joking around with drummers and, and musicians, but then I really thought about it. It's like, maybe John never got the credit that he rightly deserved because that band is derived on melody and Aaron's amazing voice. But there is a lot of intricate parts in Stain that was so cleverly placed that in a blink of an eye, you missed it. It's not like a rush where you're going to see these guys play in 2116. But when you play the parts, it can sometimes feel like that. Um, there's that, that saying, uh, simple is more. And I think Stained is one of those bands that just really, like I said, cleverly put places where they could shine. It's kind of like Van Halen. Love Van Halen because they have some intricate moments, usually in like the pre-courses in like Panama, where it's like, you're scratching your head, you're like, wait, I gotta kind of practice that. One of the hardest songs today is Jump in the Bridge for me. I can play Tool, I can do all that stuff, but that song in Jump, that one part in the bridge, it's tricky. And I think that's a great musician uh, quality to have where you can turn it on and turn it off. And I think John, as he complimented me, I'm going to compliment him. He, he played some really cool drum beats that really, to me, made the song even better. Yeah. So yeah. thank you, John. Yeah, I had um, w when I did an interview with him, I, I gave him a compliment and you're about the only person that I can give the same compliment to where both you guys have this unique way of adding hooks to songs. I mean, you, you don't, you don't that frequently hear drummers adding hooks. A lot of times they're just, you know, keeping time or whatever, but with both of you guys, I mean, there's so many stain songs where there's these little fills. He has this, Thing he does with with hi-hats and cymbals that nobody does and you know it's been a while is one of the biggest songs of all time you know in but 2001 still... it was the biggest song and it's like just in the little pauses between the vocal lines there's these little drum things that keep keep your attention and people that aren't musical probably don't know what just happened but they're still hooked into the song because of him they appreciate so... it but can't explain what they you know what they what they heard i think um 
you hit the nail on the head. John, like I said in the previous podcast that you did with him, his delicate touch and his fire when he needed to hit hard, that's a, he's a big boy. I've seen him hit hard, like shake the riser, and I'm like, whoa. Um, but then I've seen him play so subtle. And he's uh, – I think why I loved his playing so much was his finesse on the high hat, like you said, but his splash work, where he put splashes, um, like uh, fade, all these songs where he does the Chinas and stuff like that. Um, I, th- I think the song's called um, – because there's two songs in the set that I played, Open Your Eyes. I think that's on the... Um, that's from the heavy self-titled album, right? Twenty. Which one's the break the cycle? Eyes Wide Open. Oh, no. Open Your Eyes is on, on uh, Break the Cycle, I believe. Okay, okay. I could be wrong. Yeah, I am I got, a big stain fan. I got uh, you have Break it the right Cycle there. right here, yeah. And I'm, now, I'm pretty sure... Now what I'm excited about is, uh, so what, the albums that you're seeing on the wall are my favorite 12 albums from 12 guests I've had on the podcast. And what I did is you can see there's a gap here. Um, <laughs> I, I went and got six more frames. And now that I've interviewed you, I can put Phobia up there as one of my my, my favorite albums. And as you describe things that, that John was doing, uh, I feel that way with... Um, you're playing on phobia. So we're going to dive into phobia, but that album, it's like, to me, the drums are like a massive, massive part of what makes that, that album amazing. And I, I find that you have all these hooks in there. You have all these memorable moments. There's all this unique stuff. There's complicated stuff. And, uh, so I just wanted to say that as we say that about John as well, you're, you're, you two are kind of my two drummers that I, I put up there for, for that amount of creativity. Thank you. You know, also another drummer that's kind of in my eyes a little underrated, but he's a f- phenomenal drummer. Like you wouldn't even know what he does in that band, what he can do with Martone and all that kind of stuff is Daniel Adair. Nickelback. Yeah, like yeah, he's playing four on the floor. He's doing his job. But that guy, like, he's like a John Musaki. He can he's a chameleon. He knows what he has to play for the song, still look, can do his Daniel Adairisms, but still is like a really underrated drummer in my eyes. And Can- Canadian too. Yeah. So he he was he was with three doors down first, right? And then went Correct. over. Man, and it's, then it, Greg up church and then yeah. It, it's crazy how you know, it's improbable for a musician to be in one of those household name bands, those platinum bands. That's hard mm-hmm. enough. But then to be in both, say, Three Doors Down and Nickelback is is ridiculous. And in your case, with Breaking Benjamin and Black Label Society, uh, you know, I guess if you're seeing the trend of these amazing drummers that keep going from great band to great band, I guess that's the common link is that Th- those I think you know it, those musicians are great and and they're perseverant and they've networked and people appreciate them and all those things. Yeah, I, I like I and I won't say it because J- Wasaki is a friend of mine or Adair is a friend of mine. These guys are really great people off the drum set. That's a big thing for me. It's like I don't care how great of a drummer you are. If you're an a hole, you're not a good drummer. Unfortunately, that's how it works in my my mindset. Um, and off stage, I hit it off with John Gray, and I think it's because we respected each other's craft. We understood how they played and how they brought their band to another level. Drummers don't get a lot of credit as songwriters because we hit things for a living. But like we said, how we were just talking about John. Those parts, if they weren't there, I don't know. The way he put those kick drums. Now, I'm not saying Aaron Lewis or anyone or Ben Burnley didn't partake and help kind of mold these songs and we work as a team. See, that's the one thing people don't realize anymore is teamwork. It's not I and team. It's we. And... 
um, the phobia of drumming, a lot of it was me. But there were parts that been brought up. And I'll give credit where credit's due. And he came up with some cool ideas. And, and I took those ideas and I built off of them. Because um, he was a, a real strickler of hooks. And my job was to write hooks. As the previous drummer, Jeremy Hummel, who was a great drummer for the band. I mean, when you listen to So Cold, it's simple. But it's so effective. It's we will rock you. It's memorable. Exactly. So in, in my career now, I can do all the crazy stuff, but I still haven't wrote in the air tonight or, you know, Jack and Diane drum fill. I think Barry Kirch from Shinedown did a great job on um, Second Chance. Ga, go, ga, go, 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 go. Right. It's so simple, but it's actually harder than what you think, because it really you've got to get out of that box of drum clinic. Now you've got to write something that's timeless. And when you hear in the air tonight, whether you're a drummer or not, it makes you able to feel like you can play it. That's where I want to get. I just want to write one simple Honest God, Phil, that just like people are like, man, the, the, sh shut up. The part's coming on. You know, that's what I look forward to. Yeah, you uh, you and John are on the same page because uh, after I did the interview with him, I asked him, hey, can you think of anyone that would make for a great interview in the future? Any recommendations? And he said, Daniel Adair. So uh, he he's going to reach out and just see if it's something he'd be interested in. So you guys, you guys are on the same page about Daniel as well, which is cool. Yeah, I mean, I think drummers are a little more understanding for each other. You know, there's this guitar joke. Uh, how many guitar players does it take to change a light bulb? One to screw it in and the other one say they can do it better. Solid. Right? Drummers understand what we go through. So I think there's not as much animosity. It's more camaraderie and a respect because we're like, yeah, sucks. I know. Yeah, this sucks. <laughs> but you guys are great. You know, so we, we protect each other. And, um, and I'm glad that John brought up Daniel and, there's a lot of drummers out there, dude, you know, that are maybe never going to see the light of day. Um, thank God for YouTube. And sometimes I don't thank God for YouTube. I fixed my dishwasher. I've done electric. But the days of us knowing who the great drummers are, it's already been spoiled. You just go on YouTube. Back in the day, you and I would be doing an interview and be like, yo, this guy I saw last night, you got to see him in the club. If he comes to Ontario or Ottawa or anything, drive. That is what is lost. You know your competition. You just Google it. Back in the day, it was a surprise. You didn't know what was going to come and grab you in a day or so on a day off. And you're like, Yo, who is this guy playing? You know, um, even being in Breaking Ben, I, there weren't those days where I could watch the breakdowns of John Wusaki's drum parts. Now I can. So it kind of takes away the creativity of a drummer to figure out what are you listening to than seeing per se. That was the most important thing, I think, of all of us in that circle that we've mentioned so far is we had to listen and think how Neil Peart played the Russ songs. You know, in like subdivisions where you do the hi-hat thing. I always thought he did it like that until I saw him at concert go. I'm like, that's it? That's how he did it? It doesn't push you because the secret is already given. You know what I'm saying? So it it doesn't help you try to write it differently, you know? So that's the only thing, you know, about um, YouTube of my rant, but there's also great things about YouTube, you know? 
Absolutely. When when you describe uh, how how drummers, you know, they're a little different. They stick together. They think differently. Uh, I'm a I'm a goalie in hockey, and I feel like goalies in hockey are the equivalent of drummers in music, where you they have are. to be a certain level of crazy. You know, you're blamed if they score, and you're like, wait, my team. Yeah, where are the defense? why? Why did the puck get all the way to me to to protect you guys again? You should be on better defense. You know, it, it's like those things, but we all work as a team. Goalies are as important as bass players. Goalies are as important as drummers. You know, so to me, everything is a team. And if we work all together, we're going to go to the victory line. If we all try to wreck each other's um, confidence, we're not going to go to the victory line. There'll be one MVP and that's it. So you always got to give credit where credit's due. And I always use it as American football. It's like you got a quarterback, which is your lead center. And I hike the ball. If I don't hike it properly, I don't care how good your quarterback is. He might fumble it. So we're all important. Right tackle, left, all that. We're all important on that line. So... I, uh, I just had this realization. So before we started recording, I mentioned that I, I had seen Breaking Benjamin in, in Toronto and in, in New yep. York State, all these different places. So I, I mentioned that I did a road trip, uh, I guess a seven hour drive from Ottawa to Quebec City, and it was a triple bill. And it, so it was Breaking Benjamin, Stained, and Three Doors Down. And now that I think of it, it was so long ago, it might have been the three drummers that we're talking about. It was definitely you and John. And I think at that time, Daniel hadn't, you know, Daniel way later Greg joined Upchurch Nickelback. Greg Upchurch was with them. Yeah, Greg Upchurch was the drummer from Puddle of Mud. Oh, for that, for that show, you think? Oh, yeah, definitely. Because when I met Daniel Adair, he was already in Nickelback. Okay, and you had already played with Three Doors Down. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, I, I thought there was somehow there was a chance. That it would have been cool. There was one I mean, night we can, that we can use that if you want. But yeah, um, yeah, Greg, Greg Upchurch was another great, great drummer. Still is. All good. So, so people look at you today and they see this super successful drummer, this rock star. I want to take it all the way back to the beginning because there's, there's, you know, every superhero has their backstory. Uh, this is we have our weaknesses. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, a journey for you to get to where you are today. So let's go all the way back to maybe an, an earliest musical memory. Is there something that comes to you now as maybe the first time where music stood out as being something magical, something that, that was important? Yeah. Um, I always say music picks you, you don't pick it. Um, we're all, like I said, blessed equally, just differently. I never put myself on a pedestal and say, well, because I sold millions of records, I'm better than this guy on an assembly line. Cause I did that. So I'm equal to that. You just gotta be great at what you do in general. And if you're great at a goalie, you're a rock star. If you're great at being a doctor, you're a rock star. I never believed in that term anyways. Um, but back to your question, um, my grandfather played trombone and he played for Tommy Dorsey. Oh, so wow. he was in big band. Um, and I, I want to say he played with Buddy Rich here and there and Glenn Miller. And so when he was in the service, he was doing that. And when I was two years old, um, my family, my mom was going to, she was going to be a flautist for the Cleveland Orchestra, but then she had me. So I kind of wrecked that plan. So she became a um, music teacher, an amazing music teacher. Um, and so my father just kind of tinkered around on drums. Nothing like he was ever in a band. Just in college, he would air drum, play on, his, you know, on, on the floor or what have you. And um, he taught me Indigata Davida on drums at two years old. 
And I remember him going, dun, 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 right? So they bought me my first kit from our neighbor across the street. And there's pictures of it. And I'll never forget it. I was so excited to play it. And my dad played in the God of Vita for me and put holes right in the heads, right the first day I get the kit. And I'm crying. We finally get the heads fixed. And I kind of just gravitated that way, watching my dad play just for fun. But because of my grandfather saw an interest at a very young age, he was like, this guy's going to be a drummer. Well, this kid, this boy is going to be a drummer. So he kind of took me under his wing. And after he got out of the service, he became a band corps director uh, in Toledo, Ohio, Bowling Green, actually. Um, and so he started teaching me rudiments. And there's pictures of me where he gives me my first snare drum with a stupid rubber pad with a booklet of rudiments. Well, two years, three years, who wants to do that? But he really, really wanted me to be a trombone player. But doing this wasn't masculine to me. So I figured this was more masculine. So I stuck with drums. And then later on, he just said, before you play drum set, you have to learn rudiments, which is basically, in layman terms, scales for trumpet players or the Bible for drummers. If you don't know a handful of rudiments, you're not going to move musically around the drum set. Um, years and years and years later, after I became a teacher, I started to realize these people were right. And um, so I started at a very early age drumming. And I was so good at a young age, kids weren't doing it at this time. Then I got arrogant. And I stopped practicing. I just bang around, do this kind of stuff and kind of gravitated towards being an artist, drawing. And I wanted to be an architect and all this stuff. And now we're talking about my later teens. My mom, as I said, was a music teacher. She taught the choir elementary and they would do this like festival where all these schools would come together and they would perform in, in a high school. And there was this band that opened up and he's a friend of mine to this day. And his name was Chris McCoy and he was playing with his band Fortress. And my mom, after she got done performing, Fortress would play and she looked at me and she goes, you would be as good or even better if you practiced. And guess what? Hold the drums out and I never stopped ever since then. And that, like when I say I started drumming at two, well, really, what is that? Am I a virtuoso at two? No. But when I really got serious, serious was about 16 years old, like eight hours a day taking lessons. I mean, in my early, you know, 12, 13, 14, I was taking lessons, but I was so blessed where I wouldn't practice the whole week. Practice five seconds before my lesson and do fine. But what does that teach you? It doesn't teach you anything. It teaches you to be lazy and use your talent and abuse that talent. Kind of as a crutch. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, here's a kid that's struggling. Like the people I like resented in school where they were stoners and they didn't study or anything and ace their tests. And I'm like, just imagine how much more you would get accomplished if you did study. You graduate high school in two years instead of four. You know what I'm saying? So I abused it a lot. And then it was like, wait a minute. There's other people in the world that are as good as me or even better. Oh, I have a lot of shedding to do. And that's what I did. And they say, once you love something, there's no excuses. Oh, I, I didn't have time. I had to do homework. And then I had to eat. And when I took lessons later, in my later teens with a guy named Neil Smith, who basically was the hardest person in my, in my entire life and in my existence to really break my backbone. And what I mean by that is my mom got me lessons in my later teens, like I said, and 
in my head, I was like, mom, why am I taking lessons? This guy's good. Once he hears me, he's going to want lessons from me. This is how arrogant I was. And so when you get one of those humbling moments, it really breaks, breaks you down, like mentally and physically. So I go in and he's got one more year of college. So he teaches out on the side to make some quick cash. Now, this guy's a bebop drummer. Like I said, my grandfather played big band, so I gravitated towards bebop at a very young age. Um, so I wanted to really learn bebop so I could go to college to be a bebop drummer. And in my mind, I'm like, this guy's going to ask me for drum lessons. And he goes, all right, man, sit down, play me some stuff. I'm like, man, this guy's going to be blown away. I start playing and I am not lying to you, bro. He kicked me off my drum seat, off his drum seat, and said, don't you ever play that white boy mm, ever again. And I looked up and I said, that's not what I thought in my head. And he just humbled me every time. And every time I had an excuse, he was like, you eat? I go, yeah. He goes, do you go to the bathroom? I go, yeah. You go to bed? Yeah. Well, you got time to drum. I didn't understand that completely until the hunger sat in. And it was one time where I was paying him, well, my mom was paying him a lot of money to do drum lessons. If When he first couple months heard me, he would take my mom's money. But for some reason... The good Lord must have had a talk with him. He started teaching me for free. But he never told me I was a good drummer. He always broke me down. And there were times where I would go there at, his, at the conservatory of Oberlin College in Ohio and sit there for four hours. And he would come in four hours later and go, you better have your lesson prepared. I go, yeah, I got it. He goes, because if you're not, we're fighting. I go, what? So he would try to fight me in the parking lot. And I'm like, what is this? This is like straight whiplash, the movie. That's so funny. I was just thinking whiplash as you were saying it was, that. It, was, it, it gave me like traumatizing moments when I watched it. Like flashbacks. And I hated him, absolutely hated him at that time. And then there was a time where I had to have my lesson. I didn't have a drum set. So I was allowed to play on his kid at the conservatory. Well, we had a really bad blizzard that night. And I'm driving and a cop pulls me over and goes, code red, you can't be on the road. I go, you don't understand. I have to practice. He goes, practice what i don't care the law go home you can't or we can arrest you so what do i do i drive halfway home i go down an alley find a way to get because this is before like navigation in our cars we had map quest that you print out so there weren't like backtracking i just had to find my way to this conservatory long story short i get there and I practiced for four hours snowed in. That's hunger. Didn't understand that hunger until you really, your stomach's growling. You don't have money to afford to go and get Uber Eats. So you make applesauce sandwiches just to crave the pains in your stomach. That's hunger. So no more excuses for me. It's like poor craftsman does not blame it on his tools. So when you're playing a drum set on a jam night, you go, oh, man, you should hear me at home. I'm so much better when I'm at on my kit. And people would school me on that. If you can play, bro, you could play on cardboard. And he's right. So those excuses went really quick. And I started to become a man. and. He's the one that I give all credit to is Neil Smith. Uh, he lives in New York now. But um, later in my career, I did a master class at Berkeley. 
I had the pleasure to do that. And uh, real good friends of mine, the Boris's, their kids go to Berkeley. So he put in a good word and they were like, yeah, have them come. It was nerve wracking because it's like you can't BS a, a BSer because it's like these kids live and breathe drums. What am I going to show them? How to play a paradiddle? They're going to be like, no, Chad, you play it absolutely wrong. It's accent right, left, right. Right. So I was a little nerve wracking. Someone raised their hand after I got done in the clinic and they're like, didn't you study with Neil Smith? And I went, yeah, why? He's like, oh, he teaches here. And I go, well, what? What do, you, what do you mean he teach? Yeah, he teaches here. I literally had a flashback like he was going to come to the stage and put a sh- like a chart in front of me and go and play in front of the class and then fail. He was that kind of guy. He would never compliment me until the very end when I was about to go to college. And um, I didn't get into one college, but I did get into another one. He goes, you know, I was so hard on you, bro. I go, why? He goes, because you had it all along. I just never let you know about it. There's a thing called tough love. And sometimes we all need it. Right. Um, And because of his tough love got me where I am today. So sorry for the long story, but that's part of of my journey of how it all started. As as tough as that period of time was and how hard he was on you when you look back now do you look back with gratitude uh because the person you became as a drummer because of him or with yeah, his help yeah i mean it's a great question i i would have to say that if i had a time machine and i could go back in time i would never change it um yes i give all the gratitude to him and the glory to god because I felt that he put Neil in my, in my life because I was a mama's boy. I wasn't spoiled. I wasn't like, Oh my God, if I don't get this, I'm going to cry. But I mean, we were, we were blessed. We were not well off, but we didn't struggle by any means. And I think he was jealous of that because he wanted to make me a man. He's like, your mom called me for drum lessons, bro. You didn't even call me. I didn't know what that meant. Well, you so you're getting paid. What's the point? It's like, what's the point? You're a man. You should call me if you wanted drum lessons. He got me so convinced. I, if I if I left my house and ran away, I would be one of the best drummers in the world. So I got halfway down to a stop sign in the dead of winter, and I said, you know what? I'm cool where I'm at. I'll suck, (laughs) you know, but also teachers responsibility is be very cautious what you say to your student because you never know what they're going to do. So our job as teachers is like, yeah, there's tough love, but there's a teeter totter that I do. You can be hard, but you can also be soft. If they get a little carried away and arrogant, then you can be hard. But sometimes if you're too hard, they're going to walk away and and be destroyed. And what if they could have been the best drummer in the world, but you destroyed it? So I use those trials and errors with, with my previous teachers to do and to not do, if that makes sense. Yeah. I, I, I wonder if, you know, with, with maybe with any student, that's not you, you know, nine out of 10 people, they end up quitting. It's too hard on them, but maybe yeah. it's what's needed for the one special drummer to actually break through to, to fulfill their, their full potential. So it's, it's a weird balance of, you know, if, if he went a little easier on you, if it would have been the same result. So it's, it's, I really, I really honestly believe it would not be the same result. It would have never given me the drive to understand the appreciation of my blessing Um, because I abused it. I was, and it's not an arrogant thing to say. I was ahead of a lot of drummers at my age. Um, And I just, just like, I don't have to practice. It's, it's kind of like the cliche story of the tortoise and the hare. I don't know if you've ever heard this story, but the tortoise is what? 
a turtle that can't run. It's a slug, basically. And they're in a race, and he's against the rabbit. And their friends are watching him. And they're like, oh, oh the rabbit's going to beat the turtle. And the rabbit destroys the turtle. But here's the flag, or here's the checkpoint. And he sits right there waiting for what? I don't know, 20, 30 minutes. And the turtle's just that engine that, you know, I think I can, I think I can, and keeps walking at its pace. And finally, neck to neck, here's the rabbit, here's the tortoise. And the rabbit's like, finally, it takes you this long to get here, but you're here. And by that time of him doing this, the turtle won and crossed the checker. Why? Um, the line. And the moral of the story is, is this can get you in a lot of trouble and this can get you in a lot of trouble, but this will make you prosper through the world. So passion is the most important thing over talent. If someone is so passionate, they'll get there. I use this, um, saying that Mike Johnston, who's an amazing clinician, YouTube guy, uh, amazing drummer. We're all on a timeline. I might be here. This person might be here. Does that make makes me the better drummer? No, it just makes me a little ahead of the timeline. They can get to this timeline and even more depending on who's hungrier, who's more passionate. And I think that goes for anything we do in life. Um, you want to be the best architect? You kind of have to shed. You got to learn your arithmetic. You got to put in the man hours. Uh, whoever's the hungrier person can win over talent. So I've seen, I had a, a friend that's autistic, student of mine, and Guy's passion was just like I'm, nothing I've ever seen. And it was actually motivating for me. And I just prayed on it and found ways of how to teach him. He graduated Berkeley. Wow. That just tells you anything is possible. As cliche as that sounds, you think it and you believe in it, you can accomplish it. There might be a day where you're like, you know what? I want to be an open heart surgeon. And people, are, your friends are like, oh, okay, Joel, sure. <laughs> okay. But if you're that passionate and you got seven years to still go, you could be the best plastic surgeon, the open heart surgeon that you are capable of. It's just what you want to put your mind to. You uh, you knew at an, at an early age that... You, you had talent as a drummer. At what point did you realize that, hey, I, I might be able to, to make a living doing this. This could actually be a career. Is there a moment that stood out where that sunk in or you just step by step kept moving forward? as a Even drummer? to this day, money has never driven me out of my talent capabilities. Like I don't, I always look at it as a blessing from God to do what I do. And I've never tried to abuse that. I still put man hours and trying to be better than I was last year. Um, you know, selling millions and millions and millions of records and playing in front of hundreds of thousands of people in my career. I'm in a cover band right now, top 40 band. Um, and I'm having the best time in my life. You know why? Because each person there is no different than 100,000 people there. You're playing and you're entertaining because you love it. Yeah, okay, I was making great money in these other things. But so am I in, in this. It's just not on a red carpet walking and taking pictures. But I'm doing the same job. So the same job from a cover band to a multi-platinum artist, it's all the same thing. It's just what your category level is, I guess. So to me, it's always been about passion. It's always been born the entertainer. I think that's the better way of saying it. I was born an entertainer, whether 
it's 100,000 people or it's 20 people. I just love being on that stage and showing and, and to me, representing the kingdom. My best friend said it, uh, Zoltan, you play for God. You don't play for people. And I think you as a, being a goalie are very critical on yourself. You know, that saying, um, the worst critic is yourself. Oh, I could have done this better. Well, we always look at ourselves as perfectionists when we're really good at our craft. Well, we could do this better. Where this person will never be at that level. But you think you can somehow miraculously be better than what you were last night. I used to downplay my drumming. I suck. Then there'd be days where I'm like, I'm great. But it was like a bipolar vibe going on with me. And I'm probably speaking on half of the world here of musicians and artists and, and uh, athletes and all this, that we want to be the best we possibly can. But when you're knocking yourself down, you're basically saying, why didn't you give me more? Why can't I be better than that person? That's why we're all blessed equally, just different. You're built different than the next person out there. You talk different. You walk different. You eat different foods. That's the beauty of chemistry of people and a respect, I would say, for people that it's, it's not a, a race with me anymore. I want to be better than this drummer. My goal is to be better than myself. And if I make the kingdom up there happy, then I did my job. And now I don't criticize myself in my playing. God built me this way. And if that's the way he intends me to play that night, there's that. His will will be done. So to me, if I drop the stick, then it was intended that way. But I'm still got a smile on my face. We're only human. We make errors. There's going to be pucks that are going to go this way. And you know, you were supposed to go like that. Well, guess what? There's another game next week. And just look at that and just go, you know what? I'm human. But when you're in that moment in time and those eyes got those lasers on you, it's your fault. Well, be considered, you know, common courtesy to your goalie. He's not trying to give up a game, guys. He's doing all he can. I don't drop drumsticks because I like to do that. It's the nature of the beast. My hands are sweaty, right? So look at life a little bit different and go, we all make error. If a singer's telling me, oh, you sped up, slow down, guess what? So did you. Why am I the timekeeper? You should have time too. Why is the drummer always the escape goat? We're the verbal punching bag. Anything that goes wrong, it's our fault. And the, the hockey game's over, it's your fault. You let them get the goal. Well, you have a whole team to protect you too, right? So you and I are very similar, like you said, about drummers and goalies, that we get beat up pretty bad. I just don't have shoulder pads, but I still have some of my teeth. It, it does build a certain character though, right? As a goalie and as a... You know, you have to have a thick skin. Absolutely. I guarantee your skin is a lot thicker than a lot of those players out there. Absolutely. It, hey, it, when you when you think back to, let's say, about you're 16 years old, who would you say were your your biggest drumming influences and have those kind of drum heroes? Have they evolved over the years that maybe today you have some other heroes that you didn't know about, you know, may, maybe uh, Danny Carey that comes along long after you're 16 or someone like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, first drummer obviously was Buddy Rich because of my grandfather. I watched him, excuse me, at an early age on TV. And, my, and I was, it was my bedtime. I can't remember how old I was, like seven or eight. And my grandfather goes, Chad, come down right now. And my mom's like, you can stay up. And it was Buddy Rich playing with the Boston Pops. And just the fire in his eyes and just blazing chops. 
I wanted to be that guy. I wanted to be better than that guy. Um, and I never stopped. And then I started getting into um, big band and bebop at a, a very early age. And my grandfather would tell me to listen to this. And my dad was a rock and roll guy. My mom was more classical. So I was blessed to have an abundant of information, a plethora of styles to gravitate towards. And uh, so Buddy Rich was the first one. And then my dad was into Chicago and I loved Chicago. That was one of my dreams to play for Chicago. Hint, hint, if they ever see this. Um, but um, my dad had an array of CDs from Meatloaf to Graham Funk to Van Halen to the Eagles. And I remember looking through his CDs and I saw this thing live in Sacramento in living color, Tower of Power. And I pulled it out, it looked cool. And I popped it in and I fell in love with funk and that's David Garibaldi. Um, later on, my parents took me to a clinic um, at Lynn Teens in, in Cleveland, Ohio. His name was Greg Bizonette. And hands down is the reason the way I drum is because of Greg Bizonette. And now today he's a great friend of mine, which that's probably more bl mind blowing than having the career that I've had. I never thought the guy that I looked up to all these years would be a friend of mine that I actually had him on my drum DVD. I had dinner with him and his kids. It was the best feeling in the world. And such, such a nice guy. And an amazing, I can't even speak volumes of how great of a drummer and person he is. But the drummer later in my teens was Tony Williams, who played with Miles Davis. Um, and then I got into the jazz, really hardcore, Max Roach, Art Blakey, all of them, all, all the greats. Um, and then I got into Dennis Chambers and Dave Weckl and Steve Gadd and Vinnie Cayuta, all the trees of drummers. But the drummer that really took it to the next level musicality-wise was Neil Peart. And I think that goes for a lot of drummers. And it wasn't that he was faster than Dennis Chambers, because he wasn't, but the hooks that man wrote. The lyrics, a drummer writing lyrics for a band is unheard of on top of that. And how in intelligent and God rest in peace. But his drumming, when I went to go see him, it was Counterparts Tour. Uh, Primus opened up for him. And I remember the crowd going, Primus sucks. And I was like, are you out of your mind? This band's amazing. I didn't know that was their whole spiel. That's what they go as, Primus sucks. So Tim Alexander was a great drummer, and I, I got turned on to him and started listening to Primus. But watching everybody air drum that weren't even drummers was mind-blowing to me. Like, you're not even a drummer. How are you playing Tom Sawyer? I mean, you're close to it. Neil made us feel like all of us were drummers. It was fun to drum to these things. Um, and then I got into a guy named Dave Abrazes from Pearl Jam when I saw him plugged. Just the way he made the bell of a ride and his splash work. And then it was lights out when I heard Stuart Copeland. I never heard anybody play hi-hats like that. I never heard a guy put a kick where he put. And all these years, I thought it was reggae, but it's like more Middle Eastern kind of drumming that he did that we equated to one drop, uh, reggae. But he was actually a punk drummer by trade. But the way his hi-hat finesse was. So all the stuff that you hear today are all these drummers in a gumbo, stirred up. And so I get a lot of compliments, and I'm very blessed for it, is my ride in hi-hat work and splash work. Well. Just to give you a little history of the way I play a ride cymbal, Stuart Copeland, a drummer named Will Calhoun, who's amazing for living color, 
and um, Neil Peart. Neil Peart was known for doom, doom, da, 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 doom, doom, and made that ride like a little dance, right? Will Calhoun was more straight eighth notes, riding the bell and opening, scooping the hi hat. So he boom, gots, gots all the time. Then Stuart Copeland would phrase the bell to a vocal line or a guitar line. So I took all three drummers and would use bells, open hi-hats, do the dancing and voicing of melodies and put it as my drumming today. Then I heard him, you know, like wrapped around your finger and how he played splashes. And I'm like, what are these things? He was one that taught me how to play splashes and a guy named Manu Kashe, uh, Peter Gabriel, and uh, Sting, and many others. And the way he played his splash. And the first symbol my mom bought me was a splash symbol, and it came with a VHS tape of Manu Kashe showing off how to play splashes. That man, wow. He wasn't... See, when you're younger and dumb, you think chops is everything. Speed is everything. But it isn't. It's your voice. What you talk in public is the way you play on your instrument. It's your personality. And the way Manu played, I've never heard anyone play splashes like that. I wish I could go back in a time machine and just revisit that moment when I first was woken to musicality by all these greats. Um, but to me, I know it is a, a long, you know, list of drummers. Um, Zoltan Cheney is the, another drummer that I saw and I literally devoted my entire days off watching him on YouTube. And now I'm friends with him because Daniel Adair of Nickelback and I were on tour and Tom, his drum tech, and we were all like just BSing backstage. And we're like, yo, you ever see that drummer at the wrong gig? And I'm like, yeah, dude, he's crazy. But somebody, a good friend of mine in Kansas City, turned me on to this guy named Zoltan Chaney. I've never seen anyone play like this. And they're like, oh, and Tom, the drum tech goes, Zoltan's a good friend of mine. I go, what? And he goes, yeah, dude. I'll, I'm like, dude, give him my number. Just tell him I think the world of him. And now he is literally one of my best friends. And, and the moral of the story of this is be careful what you say about other people because it might bless you or it might haunt you. And because I said something positive about Zoltan, we're best friends to this day because of just that respect I gave him. And now Steve Moore, the drummer at the wrong gig, is a good friend of mine too. So it's like when you're in this music scene, I don't know about in the athletic department, but I'm sure it's the same as it's a small world. And you gotta be careful. Uh, you'll hear probably in this interview, Zoltan Channing mentioned a lot because he's like an older brother I never had. He, scripturally, he helps me. Emotionally, he helps me. And he says, what you eat is what you crap out. If you eat ghost peppers, well, you're going to have a nice night in the bathroom on your ass on fire. But if you eat healthy, you're just going to have a healthy crap. Not to be <laughs> disgusting. So whatever you say into the world, is what's going to come out the other end. So I try, I'm not the perfect human being, just try to say positive things to, to drummers, to musicians, and try to watch my mouth as best as I can. When, when you described, when you were physically showing how the three drummers uh, influence the way you play your cymbals and hi-hats and rides and all that. I felt like I got a drum lesson there, which is cool. Um, yeah. a, a, a few interviews ago, I interviewed super producer David Bottrell, who's won Grammys doing Tool albums and staying mm -hmm. in Coheed and all these amazing bands. Uh, he actually mentioned, we, we talked out of the two hours, 25 minutes, I was asking Tool questions as a huge Tool fan. And when we were talking about Danny Carey, 
He said the only other drummer, like Danny Carey is, you know, all time great, said the only other drummer that I've worked with that is like that spectacular, spectacular. He said Manu Caché. So that's um, that's when you just named him. I- I'm not super familiar with him, but oh, it just, just brought back it just brought back the David Bottrell interview where he's comparing Danny Carey to this guy. So now I know that yeah, that guy's world um, class. You've heard this song. You just don't know he was on it. Uh, In Your Eyes by Peter Gabriel. See, uh, Bottrell did uh, four or five Peter Gabriel albums. And that's yeah. that's that's the connection with him then. So um, Danny man- Carey is another great one. Um, but he wasn't. Again, everybody to me, dude, is a great drummer. It's just what I gravitated towards. I got into Danny Carey late, late before it was like when it was hit kind of thing. But I respect Danny because he doesn't play like a typical metal drummer. Yeah, he's in a prog rock band, but he's very tasty in his splash work, his ride patterns, all that stuff. And we have something very similar. We play a ride way up high. Go, go gadget. So yeah, Danny Carey is another one. So uh, along the way, an opportunity presents itself to audition for Breaking Benjamin. Can you share how you heard that the band was looking for a drummer? And then your audition was something unique. It's the stuff of lore that you were the only drummer to submit your audition on a VHS tape at a time where nobody had VHS. And uh, Ben from Breaking Benjamin apparently had to go out and find a VHS just to watch your audition. Like there's a chance he might've never even watched that based on the medium you presented. So can you speak a little bit about that kind of lore? Yeah. Like, um, I use my faith a lot in interviews just to remember where I came from. It was meant to be because no one does a VHS tape when the DVDs were more relevant. Um, so there was a reason all that happened. Um, I was working in the factory before I was working in the factory. I was in a band called switched in my er early twenties signed to immortal slash Virgin records. And, uh, we did a lot of touring. Um, and we did this one bill at the last minute, kind of just got all thrown together at the last part of our tour was me, our, my band switch non point. I want to say Revly. And then it was cold. Uh, oh, so Darwin's Wayne room, amazing band. Cold was not on our bill, uh, a band called lifer and a band called dope. Wow. And it what just a, got what a bill. Thrown at like one couple shows. I think it was. And I met this guy named Aaron Fink, who was in Lifer at the time. Mark was not the bass player at that time. He was already doing Breaking Ben. He left Lifer. And I looked at Aaron and I'm like, he looked kind of miserable. And I said, well, what's wrong, bro? He's like, man, I'm just not feeling this band anymore. I think I'm, I'm over it. I think I'm going to go join my bass player in this band called Breaking Ben. And I was like, okay, cool. I mean, Go where your heart is leading you, is what I said to him. You know, happiness is more important than being a rock star. But his band was great. Lifer was awesome. And we all hit it off great. And then later on, my band, I quit the band, and I got married, and then I started working into a, in a factory. Well, over the years of being in my first signed band, I got endorsements. And my first first ever endorsement it came full circle recently is Vader drumsticks and switch wasn't super big, but they were decent. I mean, we did Ozfest and we were, I had an MTV video and all this. Um, I would just call Chad Brandolini, the got the A&R for Vader. Hey, if you ever hear of a drummer that gets fired, let me know. He's like, bro, you're an amazing drummer. You're going to have no problem. I'm like, yeah, I am. I'm working in a factory. He's like, I'll keep, I'll keep you on my radar. I said, okay. So I remember vividly 
working in the factory and we were allowed to listen to music all the time. And that was great because it kind of motivates you. I love music. You get to work and listen to music. And I remember hearing Breaking Ben so cold unplugged on WWMMS. I think it was MMS at 92.3. Can't remember. It's been so long since I lived in Cleveland. Um, but it was one of those stations and they were doing like a, an acoustic performance of So Cold. I was like, man, I just wish I was in a band like that. It's a true story. I wish I was in a band like that. And just that like be play on the radio like this and they seem like they're pretty big. Well, here's the funny thing. Go backwards. So I'm in Switch. We are on tour with Chimera and a band called No One. I can't remember the other band. And we're playing in PA, a place called Tinks. And this band's opening up for us called Breaking Ben. And this tall, lanky dude with a book bag comes to shake my hand. And I was an a-hole. I just blew him off. I thought he was some janitor dude. I was like, bro, I got I to set up my kit. I, I got to go on stage. Sorry, man. Nice to meet you. Pleasure. You know, whatever. After they got done performing, everyone left. And I was like, this is a local band. Something's weird to me oh, they just got a record deal and they're going to record their first record, hence became Saturate. They were massive in their hometown already. Everyone left for us. And I was like, who is this band? Right? Didn't know. Years and years and years and years later, I'm working in a factory and I hear this band on the radio. And I'm like, I wish I was in that band. So... All of a sudden, I get a phone call from Chad Brandolini months and months later, and I'm praying on this, mind you. I'm like, just please, God, just give me one more shot. I get a phone call, and he goes, actually, Breaking Ben just lost their drummer. They're having auditions. I said, bro, can you put in a good word? He's like, I'll give you the drum text number. So I also had another friend while this was happening. I also had another friend who was in the business that I've acquired his I, we we came friends through touring so he would always look out for me and he goes actually i date a girl that is the no i'm good friends with this girl that dates the guitar tech of breaking ben and they're playing in columbus tomorrow well i live in cleveland it's three hours I'll, I'll go drive i already heard him on the radio so i know something is happening in their career Maybe I pissed off the lead singer because I thought he was a janitor, but we'll deal with that when we meet. So I'm about to drive to um, Columbus the night before Dimebag and Vinny get shot. Now, I know those guys personally because they were my manager's band, Damage Plan. Same with Drowning Pool. So we already lost Dave. I witnessed that on Ozfest. That was a... So Breaking Ben doesn't go to Columbus. So I missed my opportunity. They closed the place down. That's the place they were going to play the next night. I'm like, are you kidding me? There's my opportunity. So Chad calls me and goes, they're looking for a drummer. I said, I get another opportunity. I got you. So I hit up the guitar, uh, drum tech, Jay Ballinger, and I go, he goes, here's the deal. I don't care if you can play every Tool song. If you don't know Natural Life for your audition, don't even come. That's the song they care about. That song, gravita I gravitated towards that. Like, that was the easiest song for me. So at my church, my ex-wife said, Call your old guitar player and see if he can get you a camera. Well, he didn't have the greatest quality camera. And I had my mom's <laughs> school PA. And I just started learning songs on the fly. And I'm like this. I'm like, film me. And she goes, well, why don't you do this? 
why don't you just do it back to back to back to back? Not one song, stop it, one song, and I'll record you like you're doing a show. So it's actually my ex-wife that brought this up. So I did song and a song and a song. When So Cold came on, you can see this on YouTube footage. My kick drum pedal breaks. And there's a part where I have to go, right there, my pedal breaks. So in a live setting, you can't stop the show. So what I do, I flip my right foot over to my left pedal because I played a double pedal. And I wasn't a big double bass player at this time. So I was still learning the songs as I'm playing them. And I play the double pedal with my right foot. And later on, they told me I got the gig because of that. I didn't stop the show. They could see that that the pedal gave out? Yep, because it was behind. She would film me behind and then film me, you know, forwards. So she got different angles. Um, that was before GoPros, mind you, and everything, and all different angles and editing software. So it was old school. So then every time I would play, the PA would stop. It would shake the CD player and it would skip. That's another thing that got me the gig because I'd keep playing, but I still didn't miss it. I was right on the beat. So everything was against me on this audition, everything. Then I told my ex-wife, I go, why don't you do this? Just because we're funny people, you do an audition. You just start playing the Breaking Ben stuff. She goes, hi, my name's Laura Saliga. I'm here to audition for Breaking Ben. And she starts playing. I'm at my factory job. And let me back up. Sorry about this. So after we got done with the video, I take it to my friend, Chad Dennis, who I was in a band with many years ago. And I go, can you convert this to a DVD? He goes, it broke. My VCR slash DVD player broke. And I'm like, well, how am I going to get this to him? He's like, I can still put it on a VHS tape. And I'm like, what? Bro, I don't even have a VHS tape player anymore. He's like, this is the only thing I can do. And I'm like, I need it by tomorrow. He's like, well, let me just put it on a VHS tape. I'm like, okay. So he puts it out on a VHS tape. And I send it off. About... I don't know, two weeks later, I'm still in my factory job. I'm like, this sucks. I get a phone call. I'm out of work. I'm literally driving home. And a guy named Freddie Fabry, who basically got Breaking Ben's success, uh, was their tour manager and goes, hey, we watched your audition. Now I'm driving. I'm at a, a red light. We really liked your drumming, Chad. Like, really liked your drumming but it was between you and another person. And I was like, here we go, bad. All right, I was making bad news in my head. We really like your wife's audition. I went, what? Yeah, I, we just thought she possessed a little more talent. I was like, I was like, I'm divorcing her. I'm divorcing her right when I get to, to the house. And they're like, no, we were joking. You were hands down the best of all of the auditions. The crazy thing is Ben had to look in his closet for a VHS tape. Why did you send a VHS? I go, bro, I don't know. I just, that's the way God wanted it. That's the way God did. But here's the crazy thing, dude. Everyone sent a DVD. All in alphabetical order. You could click on what song. It was nice and categorized. Everything was professional. Here's my crap, you know. But because I did something out of the ordinary, the antennas came up. This is the only dude that gave us a V. I got to see this just to make fun of it. Well, if you're making fun of it, now I'm your drummer. So um, I did the audition, another audition to come to the studio. Well, not their practice rehearsal spot, which was like a music shop behind, behind was a practice area. So the VHS got you an in-person audition. Person. Yeah, they wanted to meet me 
And Aaron Fink sees me and he goes, I remember you. I go, I totally remember you. He's like, bro, I wanted you to be the drummer from day one, but I thought you were brothers with the lead singer. I go, no, the guitar player and the singer were brothers. I was, I would have left that band in a heartbeat. So it's like, again, when God wants you there, he'll put you there. When people are like, well, God just doesn't like me and my life sucks and this happens. Things happen for reasons. And we have to look at it like that. My job was not to be the drummer of Breaking Ben in my early 20s. It was like my later 20s. And it was more warming to my heart to say, now I want it more than life itself. Because I already saw what it was like to sign a record deal. I know what it's like to play on a record. I know what it's like to play in front of hundreds of people, thousands and thousands of people. Just give me one more shot at it. And then there I am with Breaking Ben. And you also know what it's like to work in a factory and, and I do. understand I've done that part of furniture. So I don't, once I'm here, chop these people down because I was that person. And I still am that person, whether I sold millions of records. These people are, what I did for a living was work 12 hours and they would make springs, or I'm sorry, studs. That was another factor. Uh, Studs for all the bridges we blew up in the war in Afghanistan. That's how long ago this was. But like we were blowing up bridges, so we had to make all these studs and I had to put all these, it was an assembly line, three people. One would push them in. I put them in a box. I put a piece of rust paper, tape it up. Each one was 45 pounds and put it on a pallet two tiers high for 12 hours a day. So I've paid my dues, but I still am paying. You know, it never stops. So every time I get an opportunity, whether it's a cover band, I thank them. Thank you. You know, it's a job, a professional job. Was was there any fear or self-doubt joining a band that was already platinum, that already had multiple chart-topping singles? Any fear or doubt, or was it more just excitement? I know I have the skills, I have value to offer. I'm ready for this. I'm the right guy, and I'm ready to do this. Or was there a mix of both? Well, when I first got into the band... Um, they were only gold on We're Not Alone. Then I toured it for like a year and did Rain um, and and the video for Sooner or Later and then did Jay Leno. That was my first performance ever with the band was Jay Leno. And no, no, you know, like, uh, don't throw sticks in the air. Don't spin them. just, Just play your part. You know, everything was going through my mind. Like, you don't mess up. Um, So that was really nerve wracking, but an amazing experience. Um, But they were only gold at at that time, like I said. And then when it came to doing my thing, I knew I had something in my arsenal that was different. I wouldn't say better, but different from my jazz and funk and all the finesse that I possessed over the years to bring to the band. And Aaron Fink was a huge fan of my old band, excuse me. And um, so he knew what I could bring to the band. And then they were all Tool fans and used to Jeremy's drumming. So the bar was already up here that I had to do more and beyond um, in, in my mind. And I thought when I heard the first stuff they were writing, and we were in Ben's basement. I heard the very first part of the riff of Diary of Jane. And I just went, not even thinking it because that's the way my brain is. Um, and I just felt that was the musical part. And I didn't know that was going to be a hook that people to this day say it's one of the best hooks they've heard in a long time. Um, I brought the shuffle back in a song called Until the End, which you don't do in metal. And Daniel Adair 
um, when I first met him, when we did our first tour together, when he was in Nickelback, he knocked on my trailer. We were doing like a festival. He goes, you, I go, what big fan, bro. He's like, thanks. He's like, you and I have a problem. I go, why? He goes, cause I don't know who spun the stick first in the video, but your video came out and then photograph came out and I spin it and you spin it. So I'm like, I don't care who did it, dude. It's been done before in marching band. I got it from, so it was funny how we broke, broke the ice that way. Your, uh, in, in your, uh, moments. Your, your first official recording with Breaking Benjamin was the full band re-recorded version of Rain, uh, which was the third single from We Are Not Alone. Does that yes. song have a special place in your heart? Because it's the first time now as a member of Breaking Benjamin that that gets out and it's a single. There's a video, it's on the radio, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, when I heard the acoustic version of, of rain. It was like a nursery rhyme, like row, row, row your boat. It was a great hook. And then when David Bendith, that was the first time I got to meet David Bendith and work with him. Um, he was like, let's do a heavier version and let's put it out for the Japan version. And I said, okay, cool. Like I'm going to get paid to, to play on, a major song i'm down you ain't twisting my arm um and when i heard back and i think we did it in nashville we were on tour if my mind serves me correctly we were on tour and we had like a day off and we recorded that song and when i heard the playback that's what i felt the song needed there was ideas of like don't come here come on on the second verse but kind of creep into it you know I don't think any of us as musicians can fully take full responsibility. We did it on our own. I came up with this part or this. Yeah, I did write the part in Diary of Jane, but if Ben didn't write that part, I would have never wrote that. So again, it's a team effort and everything goes to David Bendis with creativity too, of pushing us as musicians to try different things and say, that sucked. That's good keep doing that, go more down that road, you know, those kind of things. So speaking of pushing you as musicians, I have a quote here from super producer David Bendith. So he produced uh, multiple Breaking Breaking Benjamin albums. He mixed some of them. He did Great. both. Yeah, he did uh, both that you were on, Phobia and... Um, Dear, uh, dear agony uh, so this is what david bendith says he says what happens when you add great groove with great chops is chad saliga he went through the david bendith boot camp and i've heard <laughs> things about this boot camp and survived right through to the other side so that's from david bendith that's very kind of him yeah he's um an older father in the music business that i look up to a lot of wisdom we butt heads it's like a love hate love like you love them but then you want to punch them and i'm sure he would say the same thing to me because we have the full respect for each other musicality like i don't know if a lot of people know about david bennett not just from paramore or breaking ben or, or papa roach or any of these bands but he's an actual amazing guitarist he had his own records back in the day and there was a song, the record was called Feel the Real. And if you listen to it, actually, Jamiroquai complimented David Bendith and said, if it wasn't for that record, we would not have the music we have today from Jamiroquai. And that is pretty amazing because Jamiroquai is an amazing band. Um, and when you hear David Bendith's records, you go, I hear it. I hear virtual insanity, but David was a great musician. So to be with that kind of producer and have that conversation at dinner, I really respected the man. And I think he respected me because I was a bebop guy and I knew about my drummers. So we could have the same conversation equally. It wasn't like, oh, you're one up in me and you're doing this on purpose because you're David Bendis. He was never that kind of guy. Like I said, we butted heads. I almost fought him one time, but um, that's the boot camp. 
And I give a lot of credit to David because he did make me a, a, another different drummer out there in the session. So, so. I think with a great producer, you're going to butt heads at some point because you know, you, you have a creative vision, they have a creative vision, you both want what's best for the music for the album. Um, I, I think his superpower is that he's been on the side as a musician and as, as a songwriter, he has that talent. Then he's been on the business side as A&R. And so he knows what it takes, what radio wants, how to promote. And then he's got the side yeah. of the engineer, producer, has, mixer. Not to interrupt you, I think he has a degree in psychology too, because he's really good at getting into the minds of musicians when we're all drama queens. And I mean, like I said, he's not just a producer, he's a dad. Like we still talk to this day. He'll call me up for sessions, sessions I played on as a ghost drummer that I can't tell you, but he's always looked out for me and always believed in me. And I've always loved David for that. You know, he is family to this day. So speaking of actual uh, with David Bendeth and you mentioned, you know, a son, I actually went to school with his son, Miles. So I went to school for you audio. Did. I went to school for audio engineering and entertainment business management. And oh, wow. that's where I met his son, Miles. And then that's where I met uh, David as well. So that's my oh, okay. connection. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, his son became a DJ for a while, didn't he? Yeah. So he's doing stuff on the audio side, on the DJ side. And uh, yeah, yeah, I thought I would, I would bring that up. So we, we've That's been, so cool. yeah, we've been talking a little bit about phobia as we get into you joining uh, Breaking Benjamin. Let's like officially dive into phobia. So uh, after joining the band, you're touring behind, we are not alone. Um, and then you get in the studio, you record and release phobia in 2006. So there's three massive singles, Diary of Jane, Breath, until the end, uh, yeah. this al this album debuts at number two, which is ridiculous. Like that's huge, number two, and it goes platinum. Uh, what thoughts, memories, feelings come back to you when you think back to this album that kickstarted this massive journey, this adventure that you've been on since then? Um, man, like people again say, if I had a time machine, would I do it all over again? or change anything? And the answer is no. Even the way I, I left and, and all that kind of stuff, I think it bu built more character in me and my confidence and, and believed more in myself than the artist that I'm attached to or the success that you make in your own head. Um, phobia was so powerful that I remember a time we were like 52 weeks, number one on radio and breath came out and beat that. We were beating our own selves on radio at a time, which is on like. That's like a Michael Jackson this, kind of thing, you know, yeah, Michael Jackson. Like if you would have told Michael me Jackson. this in my teens, I'd be like, yeah, okay. Well, I hope that would happen, but I, I who knows what the Lord intends, but when that happened, um, you know, it's, uh, I'm not going to bring out like bad stuff about the band, but this is the reality of it. When you do it for so long, it doesn't feel like an accomplishment that you're proud of anymore. It just feels like work. And when the band went platinum on this record, it was really not a big celebration and it kind of hurt me because I was a part of it and I thought we could all go to dinner and celebrate. I had to beg them to go out and do karaoke night or maybe that was we're not alone. Uh, but the same thing with uh, phobia. It was just like, here's your platinum record. That's it. It's like, guys, this was like, we did something astonishing why don't you guys want to all celebrate equally? But then I realized that no matter how big your band is, there's still turmoil inside that band. There's pain, there's suffering, there's greed, there's jealousy. And what masks it all is the success. But there's still a rotten tooth inside the front teeth that look nice. So those front teeth look nice, but there's also a bad tooth back there that's hidden. 
that you would never think because all the fronts are nuts. And I think after phobia, I started to slowly, slowly see the band going in told direction of this is Ben's band, whether you like it or not, to be that bluntly honest. Um, but I think even including Jeremy Hummel and prior success, I have to add him. If it wasn't for the old band, Bug, the first bass player, and everybody, Freddie, Larry Mazur, all the middle people that don't get mentioned, this band would not be where Ben is today. And I've told him that. He might not like to hear that, but we all equally helped write. It's just what we were allowed to write. And I've, I've kind of kept my mouth hush hush for many, 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 many years about it because I didn't want to say this, but we all equally wrote stuff. And I, I'll say it to his face. I have demos. And Mark would write a riff. Now, was it a great riff? Ben had to say yes to make it work. But Ben is such a good songwriter that whether it was a crappy riff, it still would sound good. I think there was a control issue that he thought this is what the drum should sound like. This is going more into the, the dear agony. Phobia was more of a collective of, of all of us coming together and trying ideas. Um, to this day, I will never get credit, but I'll say it on the record. I wrote breath. I never got credit for it, but this is the honest God truth. And the reason I'm saying these things is I want people to understand that drummers are responsible for stuff too. Um, ben had writer's block and we were just jamming stuff in his basement. And I just started going and he went upstairs to go to the bathroom or something. He, he was frustrated. So he's like, just jam, go see what you guys come up with. So I came up with sober tool but instead of opening up the hi-hat every time i kept it closed and i just went and mark was like dum, 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 dum. and then aaron started playing and ben just got all of a sudden heard something ran downstairs and goes i got it keep jamming that and he started adding his riff then wrote the melody wrote the lyrics and said he wrote the whole song you know how many times we heard that from that guy? And we were like, yo, I started it. I framed your house so you could move your furniture to sell it. But you're not going to tell me I did a good job at framing? And I think that's a, a really sickening thing in this business is, oh, well, you just wrote a drum beat. You can't sing a drum beat. Well, guess what? If I didn't play that drum beat, you couldn't have played that riff. Or you couldn't have wrote that melody with those lyrics because that song was not a typical Breaking Ben riff, drum beat, any of that. It didn't sound like Tool. And that was one of our biggest songs. And to this day, I never got respect for it. Ben just said, you're just a drummer. You hit things for a living. So that was a lot of abuse I took from on that record. And I think... After that, there was changes and, and mental mindsets that were not healthy for the next record. Yeah, well, let me let me share for to our listeners just how big the songs were on that album. So I already mentioned that the album debuts at number two. It goes platinum. When we're talking about the singles, so the Diary of Jane goes to number two on the hot mainstream rock tracks. This is all Billboard I'm talking about. The, the one chart that really matters. That song goes... That song goes four times platinum, which is ridiculous. Then Brett goes to number one and stays there for seven weeks on the Billboard uh, Hot Mainstream Rock tracks, goes two times platinum, and then until the end uh, is number six on the uh, Hot Mainstream Rock tracks and goes gold. So almost no human being will ever know what it's like to have that much success with an album or with singles. 
can you try to describe into words what's that like? Us peasants have no idea what that means to have those accolades attached. And maybe maybe it's just another part of, of the job or doesn't mean that much, but let us know what your life was like at, at that that point. It's like all the blood, sweat, and tears of anything you've ever done gets respected for your accomplishment. Not not all the BS fake crap, like all these people come out of the woodwork and go, I believed in you. I knew you were going to make it. No, it's like you knew all the work you put in, all the sacrifices, not the parties you went to in high school, but you had to do a gig and, and you missed out on all the fun things that it paid off. And I think that was when I heard myself on the radio so much, I couldn't stand it anymore. That's what I'm saying. That's how you can abuse your privilege. Like I got sick and tired of hearing Breaking Ben on the radio where I wouldn't do that today. I'd be happy again. And the reason, you know, I'm bringing stuff up that I haven't talked about in a decade is I want people to finally really hear the true story why I quit. And uh, they never made me a member of the band. They wouldn't but they didn't like me saying I was a higher gun either. And I was like, well, you can't have your cake and eat it too. I need to work. I'll do my job for you guys. But if you don't start treating me with respect, there's other people in this ocean. There's other fish. So when I had an opportunity to go and catch other fish, they didn't like that. You're not a higher gun. You're a member, just not on a piece of paper. Well, later on in the years, when I found out how much they were making and how much I was getting, it was a lot different. <laughs> I was not a member. And um, again, phobia, I think, because of all the success that came to us so quick on that record. Don't get me wrong. This is our third record. This is our junior record. It's not like they blew up overnight, but it felt like it when I joined. And it was just massive from playing places like the Crocodile Rock in Allentown, which is like a club, to arenas. It it, it was like, wow, we're something now. So I can understand celebrities when they're in the limelight, And they start doing stuff to their face and to their body. And it really does do that to you because now you're in the limelight. Now people expect this and this and this and this from you. Nobody's supposed to fight in bands. You're all supposed to get along. You all own mansions and drive Porsches and cheat on your wives and do cocaine. It's like, what? Like, am I allowed to have one minute of happiness until we get put in this box of every musician is this person, you know? So you're, you're fighting that you're fighting around with your bandmates because they got problems in their lives and you're on a bus 24 seven, you're going to hear their issues. You're going to try to be sympathetic for their issues. And then some of them are like, just leave me alone. I don't want to talk to you. And you're like, but I'm your bro. I I thought we were bros. Like, you know, so friendship and business, they just don't go hand in hand. (laughs) From from the outside, to me, it seems like phobia was the peak of of breaking Benjamin. So this is just an outsider view that seemed like as big as, you know, and breaking Benjamin's still big. I mean, the newest album, which is a few years old, I'm pretty sure debuted at number one. They're still doing well. But to me. Um, the peak of Breaking Benjamin, of success, of radio, of certifications, and of actual the music itself is is phobia. And to to share what that album means to me, uh, I started dating someone. Uh, so it was a four year relationship, and we got together and both 
um, started to fall in love with with Breaking Benjamin, and it was the tail end of We Are Not Alone where you you came in. And the day that Phobia was released, it was on our calendars together. We went out and bought that album, and I remember we we listened to it in its entirety to take it in as a couple. And we wow. were we were blown away. Like we loved We Are Not Alone, but to us, it's like Phobia was the masterpiece that we were waiting for, and it's still like I always say I I have like 15 official favorite albums of all time. Like I've said it so many times and I have phobia is in my, you know, top five or top 10 albums of all time. And what yeah. I will do uh, in your honor, now that you've been a guest, you could see there's 12 albums behind me, 12 album covers. These are the favorite albums from the guests I've had on the podcast. And I got room for six more in the middle there. And I got the frames, they're ready to go. And I'm going to put up Phobia on the wall. You can see Stain Break, The Cycle, like these iconic albums. Yeah, they're all iconic. I, and Mother Earth is a, another great one. There you go. So I got Tool uh, Anima down here beside me yeah. as well. Uh, that's from having the producer David Bottrell on. So anyways, I just wanted you to know what Phobia means to me. Uh, Thank you. I, you know, I've been listening since 2006. I've been listening to that album constantly i know it inside out and i i i guess to to dive into uh the diary of jane so i i went on spotify this song has half a billion plays just on spotify so it might have the same amount on apple and elsewhere the music video for diary of jane has 200 million uh views on on youtube like this song this is it's crazy. Like no song has that many plays. Unbelievable. Um, I also, why do you think people love that song so much? Like that, to me, that song, a lot of times people go to that song as a representation of the band. Like, Oh, you don't know breaking Benjamin here. Check yeah. out the diary of Jane. Why do you, I know why I love the song. Why do you think uh, the world loves that song so much? Good question. Uh, I mean, I'll tell you, a real quick story about Diary of Jane. So we did it in Yonkers, New York. My wife was pregnant. Found out she's getting induced the day of my video. I literally did the video and right to the airport and they wouldn't let us fly because there were tornadoes and I almost missed my son's birth. Thank the Lord, we flew above it, and I got there to see my son being born, but it was on that video shoot. True Same story. Day. Same day. Wow, well, you'll never forget the uh, that music video then, for sure. Mm -mm. So that's what it means to me. Um, I think, here's the deal. When we were doing pre-pro, and I heard Ben play that riff, and I did the drums and everything, Ben didn't have one word. And David Bendith was there when we were writing it in pre-pro. First, he kind of busted our balls because we stole it from Seven Dust, the verse. Like that, dun, 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 right? And he thought it was kind of corny, but we fought him and we we're like, no, we want that. And I said, guys, this is going to be our biggest single. And they all looked at me like a deer in headlights. And I'll never forget it. They're like, Bro, we don't even have lyrics. I go, trust me. There's something about this. I don't know what, but I've always been blessed to know what a great song is, what it gives me that music gasm, the, the chills. I knew it was going to be a single. I knew it. I don't care what the hook would have been. It was just the musicality. Everything was the perfect recipe for, to make the cake. And when Ben finally came up with a couple of words and we we're in pre-pro, he would say, Uncola, and it became Diary of Jane. But we would always joke with that. So we had some idea of what he was kind of going to do for the melody when we were jamming. Then when we recorded it and we listened back, I was like, dude, this is going to be a big song. I'm right. And I'll be arrogant about this. It's going to be a big song. And the reason I think why people like it so much is Ben wrote such a great hook. Do you like that? Do you like that? It's such a catchphrase, like so cold. We say so cold every winter. 
and it's so cold, no pun intended, or sooner or later, I say it all the time, sooner or later, no pun intended. I really say no pun intended a lot to our songs and every time, every day life. That do you like that? Do you like that? It was so catchy that even if you didn't like the band or heard the song for the first time, you're going to say that. Then you had my drumming, which was not a typical metal beat per se, especially in the beginning, uh, where it's really like spooky. And I do all that splash work. And then that big explosion hits you. At that time, no one was playing that kind of music the way we did it. And I think that's really what people, how we took the world by storm was that one song and that style. Because So Cold is kind of still, well, I joke about it today, is Spiders by System of a Down, but is also um, like a tool bass. You know, those kind of riffs that Daria Jane didn't have that except in the very intro. And then it goes into something more heavy but more melodic. And when that chorus comes in, it's massive. And I, like I said, I think it had the perfect ingredients of a great song from beginning to end. It kept you enriched into to what we were doing. And then the video kind of like, people were like, is there a girl that died? Is it about he had problems, suicide, you know, it was a lot of different things that completed people's journal of them and their lives. So. Yeah. And, and your, your drums were another big part of that song. A lot of hooks that you provided and probably the biggest hook of the entire song is you mentioned the, do you like that? Do you like that? And then there's the pause, right? Is it a, a floor Tom hit? A big yeah, it's a pause? reverse symbol. Yeah, I hit a snare and floor. I go, boom, and it goes like that. I think that's like the biggest hook of the entire song. So it's what you said about, you know, Ben saying that line was a huge hook. And I think it's actually right after it, you doing that, it, it's those two together is kind of the, the undeniable hook, in my opinion. You know, when your song is big is when people make fun of the title and call it Diarrhea of Jay. I've never heard that, but... Three Days Grace did that to us for our last show. That's a whole nother story. I have I have a random question I've never asked before, but I was just watching uh, Steve-O from Jackass has a cool podcast where he's in a van and he interviews like Jonathan yeah, Davis yeah. from Corey right. and Corey Taylor. I love that. And he just asked Corey Taylor, he said, what did you spend your first major paycheck on? And uh, so you know, major paycheck can be whatever you want it to be. Um, but, you know, like Corey Taylor's like, oh, I bought, you know, all these DVDs and, and uh, Steve-O bought like 10 grand worth of CDs. So just curious, whatever to you is your first solid paycheck with, say, Breaking Benjamin. Do you remember what you bought? Anything cool? Yes, I do. Or maybe um, you put it all into a savings account. I don't know. Who, me? No way. I didn't even know what a savings account was. <laughs> um, I spent that stuff like it was going out of stock. Um, the first time I started making money, um, I lived at Best Buy. And at the time, Blu-ray and HD were fighting. Who was going to be the contender to stay, you know, the longest. So I bought them both just to be safe. And I bought so many Blu-rays in HD that when I would walk into Best Buy every week, they'd be like, Chad, nothing new today. That's when I knew, well, maybe I got to chill out. Uh, the first thing I bought that was expensive, and I guess it was a white man's poor Bentley, was a Chrysler 300, all decked to the nines and everything. That was like the first thing I was like, buying my first car with good credit it was pretty cool. And then they were, they were a fan of the band. That helps. What, what's funny is uh, either Corey Taylor or Steve-O, their story was Best Buy as well, where whatever they purchased, whether it was CDs or DVDs, it was six shopping carts worth. Like they actually needed some employees to push six carts. They made more money than me then. yeah. yeah, yeah. 
So I thought yeah. that was that was pretty funny. I have a comment sent in here. So I got the drummers coming out in droves to support their fellow drummer here. So this is from Dan Very Todd, fun. the drummer from Platinum Blonde. Oh, I love Dan Todd. He's a great friend of mine. And he says, Hi, he says, Chad, all in capitals, four exclamation marks. I absolutely adore Chad. As far as a drummer, he's a certified monster. Some of the drum parts he wrote in Breaking Benjamin are so challenging, but serve the song in such a clever way. My wife and I spent time chumming around with Chad at the NAM show. And not only am I proud to call Chad a friend and a drum inspiration, but we both have a strong faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless you, Chad. Love you, brother. Dan Todd, Platinum Blonde. I love that, dude. Love you, Dan. Uh, I met him through Zoltan. Uh, that I always talk about and we just hit it off. He's a great, great drummer as well. He, he won't tell you it, but he is. And um, yeah, we just, we hit it off. And then, you know, um, if, if I'm around in the vicinity, I'll hit him up or vice versa. And Nam's usually the one where it's like, I haven't seen you in a minute. I haven't seen you in a minute. And then it's like overwhelming. And then half of them are drinking when you try to get endorsements. And then you call them the next day. You're like, dude, I'm sorry, man. I was at the party and I said I'd endorse you, but I just don't remember. Can you clarify? You know, Here we go again. But nine times out of 10, it's like a good hang to see all your, your comrades. Yeah, so we 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 follow up phobia with Dear Agony in 2009. Uh, so again, this is a top five debut, goes platinum, three singles. I will not bow. Give me a sign and lights out. Some of them go to number one. You know, uh, I will not bow is three times platinum. So this again is massive success. My question is, did you feel any pressure having to follow up the juggernaut that was phobia with a new album? Yeah, I mean, again. I'll just tell stuff how it is now. Um, Dear Agony was not a fun experience at all. Um, it was nothing like phobia because Ben started to know how to work Pro Tools and um, knew how to start programming drums and was kind of working with Jason Rao, who's now in the band, who's the guitar player of Red. And um, Jason is a drummer too. So he wrote some cool program drum parts, but there was a lot of turmoil in the breaking bang camp at that time. So there was a lot going on. Ben was supposedly dying of, of an illness that I would pray for him and continue to do it as I do today. Um, he was battling alcoholism very hard. So this was the first record he ever did sober. Um, he had some, whatever he was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome or wet brain or whatever. He was battling with that. Um, there was a lot of stuff going on. New management. Mark and Aaron and Ben were not getting along at all. So hence, I'm in the studio. I have like four days to lay down drums. The pressure is on me. Ben has been sick this whole time, has not sent the label one song. They want to hear a song now. And if they don't, they're not putting out the record. So all the stress is on me. Well, guess what? This was not the phobia experience that we all had in the same room. Mark and Aaron were not allowed to be in the studio when I was recording. So it was basically Ben and I recording that whole record ourselves. He'd play acoustic, he'd jam a, a guitar, he'd have programmed drums and go, here's the kick and snare, this is how it has to be, but you can do your cool, intricate things with your hands, like splash work that people like in the hi-hat. And I was like, but the fun part is writing the kick and snare. This is how I talk. You're going to dictate it? Then he threw a contract at me and said, this is what you're going to get. You're going to be an employee, an co independent contractor for hire from now on. And you can't file unemployment. 
And if you play any Breaking Ben song out of Breaking Ben, I will sue the living crap out of you. I was taken by that because I'm like, I've been playing with you for almost eight, nine years. And now I'm just some garbage that I guess I'm doing a roof here and I'll do a roof here. That's how you're going to treat me. And I put on that smile like I did. I'm like, you know what? Lord's here. He's got my back. Whatever happens, happens. We do the record. It does really well. Couldn't figure out how it's being blessed when it was absolute evil in the whole making. David dealt with a bunch of crap, a lot of drama. But we, we all pulled through. We all pulled through. We made it done, or we got it done. And then we toured it. But this tour was the pinnacle of our career. We're selling out arenas with Three Days Grace. We're in Polestar Magazine for the biggest tour of the, of the summer. We have a video wall that I think was Jay-Z's video wall that we leased out. Um, it was a great experience, but there was something, a void, at least inside me, that was like, I'm not happy. I fake it, but I'm not happy. I don't get the respect that I rightly deserve. What, what did I do to this man to be treated like this? So after Dear Agony, kind of, we did our cycle for a little bit, and then Ben got real sick. And then um, I tried to do a, a drum DVD when I signed with DW at the time called Drum Channel. And they were gracious enough to let me do that. So I did three Breaking Ben songs. I did Evil Angel, I Will Not Bow, and Diary of Jane. And I wanted to show the world one of what I really can do on drums that you don't know has been stolen from me on records. You got to play it this way. But I don't want to play it like that. I was young and dumb and kind of selfish, I guess you would say. And I wasn't a team player. I really wanted to play what I wanted to play. So I did the DVD and I get a phone call. And the owner of DW, Don, says, hey, we got a problem. I said, well, what's the problem? They're like, well, you can't use those songs. And I said, what? what? He's like, Ben wants $8,500 for you to play those songs. I go, I helped. Like, I was completely destroyed. So I called Ben. He goes, bro. I don't know why you're calling me. I have a manager. That's why I pay him. I don't want to be in the middle of it. Why don't you play some Seven Dust songs? I'm sure they wouldn't mind. I go, because I'm in Breaking Ben. And we were on hiatus at this time. So no one knew what, what was going on with the band. So I called the manager. I'm like, bro, all I'm doing is just trying to keep our name current. Like Nothing's happening. We're just taking some time. Chad's going to do a DVD, show the drummers how to Play these songs, note for note, but do it in a professional environment. And the manager, who's no longer with us, God rest in peace, says, we don't need your likeness. Trust me, we don't need your likeness. That's how I got treated in that band. Don't get me wrong, there were some great times. But the success was slowly diminishing my sanity. I don't need to be treated like that. No one needs to be treated like, like a piece of garbage, like I'm a slave to the system. I'm a Christian and I will do the best in my faith. And sometimes I fall short from the glory of God. And there's many times I did on, in that band, but there is no reason to be tolerated. And I'm speaking on behalf of a lot of drummers out there and they know who they are. And I know the stories that, we're not a verbal punching bag, man. We're there to play with passion because we love these people. I love Ben. To this day, I love Ben. And I'm only saying these things. So if he sees this one day, maybe he'll go, you know what? I was wrong to him. And I said some really bad stuff to him of the reason why I quit in my basement. 
I almost fought him. And I said some really degrading things to him, but it was 10 years of, of pain and suffering that I, you know, people are like, man, you're so blessed. And I, yes, I was, but it's also, it was a dream that was being raped right in front of my eyes because of jealousy, greed, and anger. And I look back and I go, what, do, what can I say to the, the, the newest musician that gets the gig and is miserable? I had a conversation with a drummer that I know today who's not super in the great spirits. And I said to, to him like this, remember when you first got the gig. Don't let all the bull crap flood your, your head with drama. Remember when you first got that gig and you smiled. Take that and use it now. And that's what I continue to do. I can look back at all the bad Breaking Ben stuff that people don't know. They will now. But I also remember the good times that will always stick in my head and go, you know what? I was blessed. And when God took me out, he literally said, they don't deserve you anymore. You're out of this band. And when my fist is ready to punch him in, in, in his face, that's the okay to leave. That door just opened up. And to this day, I reach out to him. I've apologized. I don't have to, but I try to be the bigger man. I've wished him happy birthday all the time. I know the drummer because he was a student of mine. He was one of my best friends. The bass player, I got the job. People don't know that. Don't talk to him anymore. And I guess it's because I'm friends with people that Ben says, if you're going to be friends with Chad, you can't talk to me. And I don't think that's fair to anybody. I've never said to anybody in Breaking Ben fan, if you go see that band, we're no longer friends. I don't want people to hate Ben. I don't want people to hate me. I don't want people to hate the band. I just want people to understand it's not roses all the time. And there's a lot of pain and suffering, especially when you're so gifted at what you do and you love your art. And there's other people that don't care about their art or jealous of your art because you have more passion than them. And uh, how we abuse it like that with just a little bit of success. It, it's sickening to know that you have everything at your disposal and you complain at the stupidest stuff. And you're and Ben's having a grudge against me right now. I haven't talked to him in 10 years. I'm like, life is too short. God forbid if anything happened to Ben, I would be right there by his side. No matter what he did wrong or what I did wrong to him, I am truly sorry for what I said to him. But maybe there will be a day the Lord puts me in, in his path and we work again. I'll be, I'll be there. But to me, the Breaking Ben sound, me, Jeremy Hummel, Mark, Aaron, Ben. That's the true Breaking Ben sound. What they're putting out now is good, but it will never be folk. Because we had something, whether it, maybe it's because we hated each other. I don't know. You know, the, the new guys are all great guys and they all get along and I wish them nothing but, but the best for success. But maybe sometimes this just created the song we wrote. You know, people use drugs. We didn't. We just wrote the way we wrote. Ben did write a lot of the music, but he didn't write it all. Because if I said, play me the drums for Diary Jane, he couldn't play it. You know what I'm saying? So I just think that if anyone can get out of this conversation to just love one another and be mindful and respectful for each other, because you wouldn't want it done to yourself. Don't do it to another person. That's the way I look at it. Yeah, you uh, you officially left the band in 2013 because of creative differences. I think we just heard what all those you know creative differences were. Uh, from there, you joined Black Label Society. Uh, you're you're with them 2011 to 2014, culminating in the release of the album Catacombs of the Black Vatican. Um, 
when when you left Breaking Benjamin, again, most people will never be in one successful band. Was there a fear of never being in a band that successful again? And on the other side, once you join Black Label Society, like this is Zach Wilde. This is one of the greatest guitarists of all time. Are you then feeling like super grateful to essentially have a, a second chance? Third chance. Yeah, yeah that's true. Switch, Breaking Ben, and then Black Label. Um, I was scared to play for Black Label. I had many opportunities to fill in for Will Hunt and, and other things. And it just, I, I thought they were devil worshipers. I was like, still going? I don't know about these guys. They scare me. When I got the gig, they were hands down the nicest people I've ever worked for. Zach is a class act. I, I can't say anything bad about him. I mean, we joke. I just saw him uh, not too long ago in Philly with my lead singer. And he, he gets it. He tells you what you're going to make. Nothing more, nothing less. He has always been up front with his musicians. And I, I have nothing bad to say about that man. And when I got that gig, I didn't think I could do it. I didn't think I had the look. I didn't think I had the feet. I didn't think I was a biker. And then... A month later, I just went in a whole wardrobe thing and grew a beard, long hair, played like Black Label had this style. And it was an amazing experience. And to play with an icon like that, I mean, Breaking Ben sold more records. But you say Zach Wilde, everybody knows him. If it's not Ferrazzi, it's Black Label. If it ain't Black Label, it's Pr oh, excuse me, Pride and Glory or, or his solo stuff. <clears throat> um, ben is known for breaking Ben. Nobody knows Ben Barnley. There's a difference. Everybody knows Zach Watt as Zach Watt. People know Chad Saliga as Chad Saliga. They know me as Breaking Ben, Black Label, this, this, and this, but they also know me as a drummer. Um, and I think that's what I want to be known for, is a guy that can play in many sandboxes and get along with everybody. But again, you deal with egomaniacs. Not saying Breaking Ben was egos or anything like that, but you deal with that. You deal with, again, greed and jealousy. Nothing was anything like that in Black Label. They are the nicest guys and we look like the most intimidating band. Zach is hands down the, one of the nicest guys. They'd probably be mad that I wrecked his caveman style. And dude, that guy practices every single day. On his days off, he's practicing. That motivated me to go, you know, this is what I do and this is what I get made fun of from other bands. People joking like, oh, all you do is practice. Well, guess what? That's what you got to do if you want to be good at your craft. You don't stop after you sell a million records and go, you know what? I'm good now. No, you do a disservice to your talent if you think you're good enough. Okay, so you wrote So Cold. Well, we're good enough. No, you got to write Diary of Jane. Oh, we're good enough. No, you got to write I Will Not Bow. You know, it's like those kind of things. you got to keep pushing yourself. If you think you're good enough, give it up because you're still going to learn something new every day, every month, every year. You know, so I just listened to uh, Ozzy Osbourne just put out a new album, Patient Number no. Nine. I listened to it maybe a week ago or two weeks ago, whenever it came out. And uh, yeah, Zach Wilde is on four of the 13 tracks. So almost every track features somebody that's known and he's featured on that new album more than anyone else, just to show you like there are levels to this game. So it's, it's wild. I just had a no pun uh, intended, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, lots of pun intended on this one. So, um, uh, Recently, I had a guest, Dan Preston, who's one of the top live sound guys in Canada, working with I Mother Earth and Finger Eleven and Big Rec Great and bangs. whoever. And he just posted a picture. He goes, man, I just got a last minute gig. 
and he shows a picture. It was with Zach Wild. So like, I think, I don't know, on the day of, he got a call to do sound for Zach Wild. And he, there's a picture of him with Zach. And it, it, is he, to sh- not to interrupt you, is he with them now? I am, I'm not sure. I just saw the one. Because if he day. was with him when I saw him, I went up to Zach and I said, yo, hands down, the best front of house mix I've ever heard for this band. I'm not even lying. It was the best sounding I've ever heard. Well, obviously I played in Black Label, so I can't hear myself. Yeah. But I've watched videos and 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 heard from people. Hands down, he's like a member of Black Label. He's that good. If it's the same guy. Well, I, I hope it is. So the guy's name is Dan Preston. And he actually... Zach Wilde is his hero. Like this was a, a bucket list moment that he can die now having yeah. done that. And uh, he actually looks like him. Like he's got the long hair. He's got the beard. He's, he was the guitarist for a band in Canada that were big called Clark Nova. And this guy can shred. And he just posted a picture that a different member of, of uh, black label society just gave him a two hour guitar lesson. So even though Dan Preston is an incredible guitarist, it shows like he's still out here getting lessons from members of Black. Well, Pierre Labor. did too. I mean, that's a drummer of Rush who studied with Freddie Gruber for many years and just took his drumming and played traditional and his whole drum set. Everything about his way of drumming, of what he did, was wrong in his eyes. You know, and he did have a humbling experience when he did the Burning for Buddy where he would pay Amish to Buddy Rich and have all the greats play on it. And then when it was Neil Peart's time, he played Cottontail. And you're expecting Neil Peart, who's putting this whole thing to just slam, and he didn't. He couldn't swing out of a paper, you know, like he just couldn't hold a beat in the paper bag. So like he realized I'm Neil Peart, I'm putting this on. I can't play jazz. I'm going to go learn from a guy that is Buddy Rich's best friend who can teach me it. That right there tells you something. You always can learn. You know, same with Zach. Zach is still learning. It's like, it's who, who are you learning right from when you're Zach Wild? You know, it's yeah. from himself now, probably just playing all different stuff. But you always, I mean, you're always learning a new word and then wearing it out like crazy. Like I'm flabbergasted. Okay, Chad, I heard that on. I'm flabbergasted. Then you lose that because you wore it out. Then you get another word and you wear it out. You're still learning vocabulary in the world that we walk through in life, right? He has to be learning other guitars. He's going to because he has to do Pantera. Talk about a big, big pair of boots you got to fill. And he was friends with Dimebag, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how, like, grew, grew up together. From what I've been told from the previous guitar player, they were friends. Obviously, he has Scully tattooed, but they never, like, grew up in high school and elementary yeah. or anything like that. But they started to become friends as, you know, Panter and Zach Wild. Yeah, when you're two all-time great guitarists, you you know, yeah. you have that pull towards each other. So that album, Catacombs of the Black Vatican, that was a top five album on Billboard, uh, two singles, My Dying Time, Angel of Mercy. When I checked out the credits for the musicians that played on it, there's only three names. There's only three of you. Um, did, did that feel like there was a wide open canvas for you to lay down what you wanted to do for those songs? It's not like there's 12 musicians in the studio. It seems like it was Zach Wild, you and one yeah, other person. Yeah, it was person. just JD, myself, and uh, Zach. Um, we wrote those songs that, you're, that you listened to right when we were learning them. Zach had a riff. I had a drum beat. JD had the bass line. Zach might have a couple more riffs that were thought out, but they were all ideas. And then we would jam it a couple times and then hit record. We did a full record in like three, four days. They worked so quick, but they're also great musicians. 
and there is a black label sound. So like when I do all this bell work, Zach would be like on the talk box. He, he calls me Cobra of Chaos. He goes, hey, Cobra. I'm like, yeah. He goes, you know that jazz shit you do on the ride? I'm like, yeah. He's like, keep it in Walmart's parking lot. I'm like, okay. So he started doing some stuff and I get out. I'm like, Zach, he's like, what's up, Cobra? I'm like, you know that guitar crap you play? Yeah, keep it in a Walmart parking lot. Like I'm saying this to people that like bow down at him and I'm like, whatever. You know, we it was just a great experience there in that studio. He allowed me to do me. And I think, just speaking of myself, that is one of the only Black Label records that doesn't have that typical immigrant vibe Zeppelin. It has more Soundgarden and more stoner rock and really like heavier groups. Uh, the one that Will played, Order of the Black, that that's one of my favorites. Um, like Great of the Dead and stuff. A lot of great, great drumming on that. Yeah, Angel of Mercy, one of the singles is one of my favorite tracks. That one's kind of a, a slower song. Are you a sucker for a good ballad as well, or is it just me? Just me? I am. I, I think they're the hardest to play. I go with like Chad Kruger says. Yes, everyone, it's not Chad Kruger. It's Chad Kruger of Nickelback. And he says it is so easy to write a sad song. It is so hard to write a song that makes you want to go drink with your buddies. And it truly is. So I get emotionally attached when I heard Angel of Mercy. And drumming to me, even though it sounds like I'm thinking a lot, I don't think. I go by feel. What I'm feeling, there's a part of my brain that says, that sucked, don't do that ever again. But there is a part of my brain that goes, because he's hitting this chord, you need to play this crash to emphasize the sound, the frequency. Uh, but when I heard that, it, I know it will yep, bust my chops on this, but it, Angel of Mercy was really hard to play because it sounds like one by U2 and Stairway to Heaven in his guitar solo. So it was really hard to not play the U2 drum beat or play the fills or the intricate part in Stairway to Heaven. We all take stuff from musicians. Uh, good musicians borrow great musicians still. So when I heard that riff, I knew it needed to be subtle, like kind of like one by um, U2. You're just there to support the melody. Again, there were no lyrics. It was just a riff. But I knew there was something special like Diary of Jane. His, like his guitar playing is like no other. Like the way he attacks and comes down. And when I heard that, I was like, I know exactly what I'm going to play. And then JD, the virtuoso he is on bass, made it easy for me to find the pocket. And then when it came to the big guitar solo, which... I never heard because I was just doing from beginning to end and writing a bridge as we speak. There was no guitar solos. He did that later on. So if I heard the guitar solo, I would have felt it a little more there and maybe opened it up. But when you're writing and you've been doing it for years, you've painted that canvas many times. You just don't want to keep using blue all the time. Sometimes you got to get out of that box, no pun intended, and do some yellow. And then sometimes you got to go back to blue because Black Label has a certain sound and certain fills that are Black Label. So you, you have a blueprint to work with. Yeah, so after, after Black Label Society, uh, you joined Black Star Riders from 2017 to 2021. Um, for our listeners that maybe aren't as familiar with Black Star Riders, uh, it's members of Thin Lizzy that are recording one member and are, are well not to interrupt you the, the actual thin thin lizzie like boys are back in town jailbreak is scott born he's the original guy ricky warwick came in later actually when i played with black label and thin lizzie and judas priest that's a weird one um ricky became the singer um but 
you had John Sykes, Tommy Aldridge. They, there was eclectic of different musicians in that band. But the original, original guy of Thin Lizzy was Scott Gorham. But then they had Brian, the drummer, and I think the keyboardist. I think he passed away. Don't quote me on that. Those three were the Thin Lizzy guys. And Ricky was same for that Thin Lizzy. But Scott, off on the record, is the, the major one. So, so with that band in uh, 2019, you guys released an album, Another State of Grace. Uh, you can hear, so I listen, I listen to your entire discography, everything you've done, I listened to in preparation for this. And that album, you can hear kind of the Thin Lizzy sound underneath it as far as they have unique vocal harmonies and they also have unique guitar solo. So not, not specifically where there's the, solo in a song but they they have like doubled guitars where they're doing like harmonies of each other and it's so catchy and it's something unique uh was it was there kind of this acclimation period of going from breaking benjamin and black label society to then playing with black star riders where it's more of a you know straight ahead straight rock. rock yeah was, um, no. did you have to hold back on on the craziness that you're capable of and do what's most suited for the song that you're playing, which is a challenge in itself. Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. So I use metaphorically a tool shed. Okay. There, you buy all these tools, but you spend a lot of money on a sledgehammer. You're not going to use it on every project, but when you do that project, you can go in the tool shed and grab it. So I've acquired many skills. <laughs> I've acquired a lot of different things in a tool shed. And whatever that song requires for the tool, I grab it. If I don't need it, I put it back in the tool shed. But I always keep them sharp and clean and not rusty. I always go back to them. And then it's kind of like, looks like Armageddon. Is hitting my house. Um, the Black Star Riders had another sound like Black Label, Thin Lizzy. So Thin Lizzy is totally derived on groove and swung feel. Brian is a great drummer at that. So I had to stay true to the swung feel. Like I like to swing every band I play with. And I think I... I don't want to talk myself up, but I think I've acquired a style to my drumming that if people do follow me, they know it's me on any record. Um, if it's a producer and saying you can't do chat isms, then I can confuse the audience. Um, but nine times out of 10, I do have a style and it's usually with the ride plane or the hi hat, stuff like that, splash work. And just grooves in general. So with the Thin Lizzy stuff, they allowed me to do kind of what I do. Scott is a drummer's. He loves drummers. And he's like, bud, just do your thing. If we don't like it, we'll tell you not to do it. And there was times where I do some more intricate Stuart Copeland hi-hat work. And they were like, not for this song. It's great. See, that's when you become understanding in the business professionalism you're getting your point across but you're not a dick about it you know so it's like and when you and when they're nice okay cool i won't do it but if you're an ass then you're like screw you i'm gonna do it just because you ticked me off so they were very polite on how they said don't do this or do this or, or that and and jay the producer Rustin, awesome producer, great experience doing that record. It was a lot of fun. I have uh, I have some kind words here from Jay Rustin. So I go way back when I was when I was seventeen. Uh, I did my last semester in high school. I had a co op at a studio in Ottawa called Distortion Studios, mm -hmm. and. And there's a connection there with Jay. I don't know if Jay's originally from the Ottawa region, but 
the people at the studio knew him and talked about this guy, Jay, that was, I guess, going to LA or wherever. And yeah, he was this amazing dude and he's gone on to do incredible work. So yeah, I have this is. connection that goes way back to Jay. That's, and for those that don't, cool. for those that don't know Jay Rustin, man, he's worked with anthrax, stone sour, meatloaf, ever clear theory of a dead man, steel uh, Panther, steel Panther. And he, like you mentioned, he produced and mixed this album, another state of grace. And this is what Jay Rustin has to say. It says, Chad is an amazing drummer. He has incredible finesse on the top of the kit, which a lot of drummers lack. He's also hilarious. So that's from Jay Rustin. He's a good cat. Thank you, Jay. Yeah, um, Jay was one of, every, every producer has something dear to my heart. Kind or great musician or great ideas or hardworking. Jay was all of it. Jay was a funny dude. Um, it was, it was an amazing experience because we, I'll, I'll give it a selfish plug, but it's called Sphere Studios. And it was Linda from Four Non Blondes old studio. And so a guy named Francesco from Italy rebuilt the whole studio. And um, the studio was immaculate, like drums all stacked on shelves you could pick whatever drums you wanted but the best part of the whole experience was he had like i don't know don't quote me but forty thousand dollar coffee machine and you would make like starbucks coffee every morning ground beans everything you put it in i was getting so good at it i would clean it out for him and put the coffee grounds and he got his beans from Italy flown in. And Francesco, the owner was such an amazing host. Um, it was just, it was, and, and Jay, it was a different producing moment because Jay is the guy that just kind of sits back, lets the band do what the band does doesn't one up and go, let me consult my platinum record kind of guy. You know, it's like, do you, if I think it's getting a little off, I'll put my two cents in. Other than that, I want to create timeless stuff. I want to write appetite for destruction. So when I did the drums, I would listen back. And I'm like, man, I got off the click. He's like, no, you didn't. I'm like, no, I did. He's like, I don't care about the click. You made it feel good. You guys sound like a band. You're playing in the same room together. And no word of lie, it was like two takes, maybe three takes at that. And half of the time, Scott Gorham was like going, damn it, after my take. And I'm like, bro, it's for me. You get to play guitars later. But he was in the moment thinking, oh, I messed up. I'm like, yeah, you messed up, but I played through it. Don't announce it. It was a pain. I spent more time in a massage chair at the studio than I did on the drums. But I was a part of it. I helped create some ideas with Robbie. That he's an amazing bass player. And all the guys. And Jay was just the cherry on top, man. He was just kind of just nurturing it, kind of just kind of floating above the whole experience. There wasn't like one upping or anything. And I thought we wrote a great record. Yeah, the the album the album comes out has three singles. So another state of grace, ain't the end of the world, and candidate for heartbreak. The album goes to number one in the UK on the rock and metal charts, which is awesome. Uh, your career has allowed you to tour all around the world. Do you have any favorite places that you like to visit while you're on tour? Any places stand out? I mean, it, I've had this question so many times. Every place has something to offer. But the only one, because it's just the scenic view and where the location is of the stage was breathtaking, was the gorge in Washington. Where, like, you literally could walk off and it looked like the Grand Canyon. It was gorgeous. And I did OzFest there. Ozfest, wow. That's yeah. amazing. 
That's so cool. I hear that Zach Wild at some points had to do double duty on Ozfest, where it was he, uh, he was playing with Ozzy as well as either his solo or Black Label Society. He was double dutying Ozfest and drinking on top of it. So yeah. he was smashed at the at the Black Label time, and then had to go play for Ozzy, and still never missed enough. Could do it in his sleep. I have one final quote for you here. Uh, this is from another amazing drummer. This is Rich Beto, uh, Finger Eleven, Saint Asana. Oh, he's great. Uh, man, he always gives me the best quotes. This is a long one, so buckle up, grab some tissues. Here we go. Uh, Rich says, Chad is one of the best drummers I've ever seen in my life. My jaw drops to the floor every time I've been blessed enough to share the stage with him. Chad has created a sound of his own over the years, combining master chops, feel, power, and grace. He has written many drum parts that drummers will try to duplicate and figure out for years to come. Just look on YouTube and see the countless videos of drummers playing his songs. During his time in Breaking Benjamin, I truly believe he was the sound of the band. Not many drummers out there have made such a mark on music that when you hear a song come on the radio, you know it's him. Chad is that guy. Since then, he has continued to amaze me with many projects he's been a part of. In this drummer's eyes, Chad is a god. Uh, but beyond his ridiculous, see, it's a good quote. Uh, but beyond his ridiculous playing ability, there's Chad, the human being. This aspect of him is why I have such love for him in my heart. Chad is a loving, caring, and kind soul. His heart is massive, and he cares about others' well-being. Chad lifted me up when I was feeling alone, forgotten, and at death's door. He reminded me of my worth and made me feel like someone cared. I'll never forget that. I can't wait to see what's next for him in his career, and I truly believe he hasn't even scratched the surface yet. Whatever that is and whatever he does, I will always be his biggest fan. I love you, dude, and thank you for always inspiring me to be a better musician and a better man. That's from Rich. Wow. Kudos and ditto. Um, Rich, I'm, I had the pleasure to do a bunch of festivals with Finger Eleven, and I was a huge Finger Eleven fan way back in the day um, before they really broke with, uh, I think it's Paralyzed. Um, I never, before I saw Zoltan, saw a guy play drums like that, but still keep the groove. And, and my wife and I would watch him and he would like talk to his drums. He'd go. And again, it's the personality is how you play. And when I met him, he was like that. Just a chilled, calm, just entertaining, funny soul. And uh, we've stayed in touch ever since. And then when he was going through some stuff with a, another band, I wanted to lift him up because he is worth more than he knows at his drumming. And he's a great father, a great husband. And he's gone with some up and down roller coasters like we all have. And, and I'm sure, you know, he would be like, I'll do it all over again. I would probably do it differently. But, man, I, I don't think he, I would want him to because it made him the man he is today. And that's the most important thing is what you are now, not before but now, nah. and he's become such a, a great guy. And he's always been a great drummer. I don't even have to say that. I think everybody knows that. What he brought to Finger Eleven, what he brought to Saint Sonia, um, whatever he touches, is magic. And you know it's rich. You know. So thank you for the kind words, Rich. I love you back. So I have two final questions, and these are a little bit deeper, uh, and here we go. Do you have any musical dreams that are still in your heart uh, that you would, like to, you would like to attain or accomplish uh, someday? You've, you've done a lot, all these platinum certifications and this and that. Is there anything that still eludes you that you have on your bucket list to work towards musically? Um. I, I mean, I love producing. I want to get more into management, helping people to, to live a dream that could be a reality um, and just take people under my wing and show them what the real world is. I don't sugarcoat it for them. I tell them, this is what happened to me. I don't want it to happen to you. 
Um, but take it like a grain of salt, you know, like if you have to learn the hard way then learn the hard way, but I'm just trying to tell you, so you don't, but I mean, to me, I don't want to sound like Jimmy Stewart, but I just want to bring people to God through my drumming and, um, just play for the kingdom and, you know, wherever the Lord leads me to on my next journey, like I am playing with my band, turning the tide. Um, they were gracious to, to let me play with them. Um, a lot of people don't know, but I'm not vaccinated. And, um, that's just my opinion, my belief. And I lost my job because of it. It wasn't, I don't put any fault on anybody. I put the fault on the system. Um, but I am still friends with unvaccinated or vaccinated people. And I think that's how we should be. Um, I believe in God. I have friends that are atheists. Everyone's entitled to their own views. My job, your job, everyone is to love each other equally and understand everyone is different. Um, so for the band to allow me, actually my drum students, their booking agent. So he got me the gig and it's the singer fuel, uh, John. And his girlfriend is the other singer. And then we have a bass player named Garrett. So I've been doing that full time. And then I have my band. Do you remember a band called Primer 55? Yep. Do you remember, I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, a black guy with dreads who played bass? I'm not sure. It's been his a name while. is Kobe, Kobe Jackson. He used to be in also... He played guitar and fronted singing uh, for a band called Alston. They used to be called 60 Cycle, um, but then they changed it to Alston. He's my singer, or our singer, and then I have a previous band called Walking With Lions, the guitar player who was our guitar tech for Black Star Riders, who's phenomenal, uh, in a band with me, and we and our new band's called Love Sick. So hopefully, hopefully we're getting our mixes soon we'll have something for the world to hear. So that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Final question. If you could go back in time and you could sit down next to your 10 year old self and you could take all the lessons you've learned over the years, all the experience, the mentorships, the ups and downs, if you could provide some advice to cute little 10 year old Chad that's sitting there to help guide him <laughs> through this life, what advice do you give him? Don't play in any more bands with beasts. Start working into the seas. No. Um, I would just say love yourself and know that it's going to be all right. Um, the only person that's going to steer you in the right direction is the Lord and Everyone that is going to be a bottom feeder, cut them off. Don't throw pearls to swine, but still love everybody equally. Just don't enthrall yourself into their drama and shut your mouth. That's what I would say. Where can our listeners find you online? So those that have listened to this, it's almost three hours now. We're just about to wrap up. I know. I talk a lot. Oh, it's all um, good. That, that, that helps when you do an interview and the other person actually talks. Uh, where can our listeners that have been with us for three hours that say, man, I, I want to connect with him and let them know I love the interview or I love his music or if they want to find you online, where do they go on social media or... Yeah, and, and Joel, thank you so much, by the way. I, it's been an, an absolute pleasure, and, and hopefully we can keep this relationship thing going. Um, they can go on to Instagram, just Chad, S-Z, as in zebra, E-L-I-G-A, Instagram. Same thing for Facebook, YouTube. Um, or they can email me at chadsaliga at gmail.com. And then they can go to chadsaliga.com, my website. Perfect. And so turning the tide as well. And then hopefully lovesick once I have that up and running for Instagram and all that, they can all reach me on all that. So as we wrap up, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge you for your lifelong pursuit of mastery as a drummer. You know, you're showing that, that uh, hard work and dedication 
what you can accomplish with that. You've proven that that can take you to the very pinnacle of the entertainment industry or whatever it is, you know, that the listener, whatever their dream is, if they work hard and they have a vision and they follow through, um, Mm -hmm. you, you show us it's okay to dream bigger and to go for it. And that some things are worth suffering for. Um, I I want to, uh, acknowledge you for all the amazing music you've made across the spectrum of different bands. Uh, In my case, phobia is soundtrack to my life. And I know millions of people around the world, a lot of those albums mean a lot to them. And, uh, thank you for providing quotes for both rich Beto and for uh, John Wysocki on their episodes, um, you can tell from their quotes back to you that you providing the quotes in the first place meant a lot to them. It's, you know, sometimes, you know, we don't hear uh, kind words very often. Sometimes it's, it's, we're not in a world it's refreshing. That, yeah. Yeah, that loves to do that. And last but not least, I want to thank you as a fan of yours for, I don't know how long now, the last 15 years, um, Thank you for sitting down with me for the last three hours. I got to pick your brain as a fan. I got to ask questions I wanted to know the answers to for a long time. Uh, So it it means a lot. Thank thank you, Chad. Oh, no. I mean, pleasure is all mine. Thank you for taking the time and allowing me to do this. You're very welcome. So to uh, to our listeners, to the Chad fans, Breaking Benjamin, Black Label Society, I, I got to go through all the bands you've been in here. So to the fans of everything that Chad has done, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you guys. God bless. If you've enjoyed today's episode of the podcast, please take a moment to subscribe, like, comment, and share. What I want to know is who would you like me to sit down with next for a two hour deep dive interview? You can let me know by reaching out to me on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok at Joel Martin Mastery. Joel is J O E L. And you can find me on Twitter and Snapchat at Joel Mastery. So I am done. I am complete. I approve this message, and I'll see you on the next episode. <laughs>